This video is sponsored by NordVPN. You know what would have prevented a lot of problems in the Danganronpa series? Good web security. Now, I very seriously doubt that many of you are in danger of having your personal information dug into by an evil teddy bear, but there are still plenty of people who'd like to get their hands on your personal data that you'd probably prefer to keep far away from it. And you're in luck because NordVPN has you covered. You're just one click away from over 5,300 servers in 60 different countries, whether it be one near you for better speed or in a faraway location for more content. NordVPN will help you stay private online, giving your internet a secure and encrypted connection which is useful for guarding against hackers and other such undesirables on a public network, but they can also provide masking for your IP address, browsing history, and personal data even at home. And on top of all that, my fellow anime fans will probably be happy to know that it fixes the problem of being unable to find your favorite shows on your streaming platform of choice. Just set that sucker to the appropriate location and boom, the show I wasn't able to find five seconds ago, now I'm watching it in top quality. And this is just one of the many things NordVPN makes it easy as cake to do. With amazing speed, incredibly easy setup, no bandwidth throttling, a way around geoblocking and even widespread access across all of your devices of choice, is it any wonder why people think NordVPN's the best of the best? And if you want to join the club, you're in luck, because Nord's offering all of my viewers a deal. Just go to nordvpn.com forward slash NezumiVA to get a two-year plan plus one additional month free with a huge discount when you use coupon code NezumiVA at checkout. Trust me, for the quality of the service you're getting, you won't regret your decision. Thank you to NordVPN for sponsoring today's video, thank you all for supporting this channel, and now, let's get this party started, shall we? <laughs> The long-awaited third entry in the Danganronpa series has finally arrived. After a twistedly creative concept hit the scene in the first game and was greatly refined and expanded upon in the second, it's time to see what the th no wait, <laughs> you guys didn't forget this game, did you? Yeah, yeah, I know you already all saw the title, so I couldn't actually pull the wool over your eyes, but I'm a little surprised. After I wrapped my retrospective on Danganronpa 2, so many people just assumed I'd be heading right on into V3. But that's not right, this is a series retrospective. I can't just leave out two majorly important entries to slide right on into V3. Especially because, as was so kindly pointed out by series creator Kazutaka Kodaka before V3's release, it takes place in an entirely separate universe. And no, that's not me dumping a V3 plot spoiler, that is something that was legitimately stated before V3 ever came out. And for good reason, because the next two entries we're looking at are the extra trimmings meant to tie up the entire Hope's Peak Academy saga once and for all. But before we can head into the anime finale of the original Danganronpa storyline, we first have to take a detour to an unexpected place. A third-person shooter game. Yes, everyone, today we're talking about Danganronpa Another Episode, otherwise known as Ultra Despair Girls, or Zetai Zetsubo Shoujo, meaning Absolute Despair Girls, in its original release. But what is Ultra Despair Girls, you may ask? And indeed, I find a lot of people may be asking, since this game gets pretty overlooked nowadays, for some reasons I find understandable, and some I find a little silly. Well, UDG as I'll be referring to it for short, is yes, a spin-off, but in terms of story importance to the franchise, it's actually rather crucial. Though it takes on a completely different gameplay style than the series' typical visual novel adventure game stylings, this game takes place about six months after the events of the first Danganronpa, and shortly before the events of Super Danganronpa 2, in something of an attempt to bridge the two together. In it, we take control of Komaru Naegi, the younger sister of our protagonist Naegi from the first game. She's been imprisoned in an apartment building for about a year and a half since the tragedy began, but one day is broken out by a Monokuma robot who tries to kill her. After escaping, she's given a strange megaphone-shaped hacking gun to defend herself by the intervening Byakuya Togami of the Future Foundation, and tasked to survive amidst the chaos of the crumbling Toa City, pursued by a group of murderous children known as the Warriors of Hope, and joined by returning literary connoisseur Toko Fukawa and her salaciously sadistic serial killer alter Genocider Show. 
The game was born as a project that members of Spike Chunsoft were clamoring for, a more action-oriented spin-off game. The previous entries were all well and good, but the team wanted more opportunity to flex their creative game design chops within a framework that wasn't quite as restrictive to interactivity as a more straightly played visual novel was. Series creator Kazutaka Kodaka was one such proponent, having claimed to always want to write a story about two characters running away from despair, with an action game being the perfect structural medium for making that story happen. With a green light from corporate, the team got started on their Danganronpa action game, and Kodaka was given complete free reign to write the story. Though the team was concerned over whether such a drastic shift in gameplay styles would alienate series fans who weren't good at action games, they decided to add the mechanic of switching between characters so that more inexperienced gamers could more comfortably progress by using Genocide or Show when possible. The game was officially announced at a Sony Computer Entertainment press conference in September of 2013, very shortly following the release of Danganronpa the Animation, which had aired from July 4th of that year to the 26th of September. This anime adaptation of the first game, though sloppy, would prove to raise awareness of the series to an even wider audience outside of Japan than just the initial crowd grabbed by the Something Awful Let's Play threads. And considering that the localization of the first two games would shortly follow this after the October 2013 release of Danganronpa 1.2 Reload in Japan, this gave people plenty of time to get excited. The early trailer still definitely had yet to be fully polished into the experience UDG would become, but it teased the game's third-person action style, attacking Monokuma robots, and a cryptic hint towards the series' future with the closing text line of, and also three. Apparently, though a VR version of the game was briefly considered, Kodaka said it was ruled out due to other companies working on their own VR shooter games, and the team wanting to create something only they could make. When crafting potential concepts for this VR experience, series producer Terasawa envisioned a first-person perspective of one of the series' executions, with Monokuma included to lighten the mood, and this would eventually become the free-to-play experience Cyber Danganronpa VR The Class Trial. The game was finally released in Japan on September 25th of 2014, with a localized release from NIS America following on September 1st of 2015, about a year later. The game received generally positive reviews, with Famitsu giving it a 35 out of 40, and the localization receiving more average scores, around the 6 to 7 out of 10 range, with Game Informer giving it a rather scathing 5.5 out of 10. During its initial release in Japan, the game sold 70,596 copies, with the number jumping to 85,930 in two weeks. The composer of the last two games, Masafumi Takeda, returned to compose the soundtrack and did an excellent job as usual. And the game also received two manga adaptations, one by Machika Minami, focusing on the perspective of Fukawa and Shell, and one by Hajime Toya, which more directly adapted the game's plot, both running from 2015 to around 2017. This game is not included on the Danganronpa Decadence collection on Switch, but is still available for purchase in English on PS Vita, PS4, and PC via Steam. Though, if you want to play with the Japanese audio track, it comes as free DLC for the Vita version of the game rather than being included directly on the game's cart. As you might can tell by the more middling reception than usual, UDG proved to be a more polarizing game than the previous two in the franchise, and I think that's basically the key word I would use to describe it. It's a game that certainly has its strengths, but also an abundance of weaknesses. But to get into the nitty-gritty of that, we'll have to talk once again about the game itself, from start to finish. Why is this game loved by some, but hated by others? What does this game do right, and what does it do so horrifically wrong? Why is the general consensus on this thing so split that when I announced I was making a video about it, half of my comments were from people eagerly awaiting to see my thoughts on their favorite game, and half of them were from people preemptively offering their condolences that I had to discuss this horrendous piece of garbage? Well, there's only one way to find out. Fasten your seatbelts, ready your hacking guns, and let's brave the nightmares of Toa City together as we take on Danganronpa another episode, Ultra Despair Girls. Danganronpa.
As previously mentioned, the game begins with Komaru Naegi, younger sister of the first game's protagonist whom I'll be bucking my trend of using primarily surnames for and calling Komaru because, well, it'd be a little confusing to call both her and her brother Naegi, now wouldn't it? Continuing the series' trend of telling casting decisions, she's voiced by Aya Uchida, best known for playing Kotori Minami in Love Live, which should tell you quite a bit about the general vibe they were aiming for with Komaru as a character. The intro sequence, among several others in the game, is the first time this series has had fully animated cutscenes in an anime style, and these are all put together by Studio Lerch, the studio responsible for Danganronpa the animation and Danganronpa 3 after it. They look pretty good, honestly. And while I would argue one of the biggest weaknesses of the television adaptations of this series is that Danganronpa's character designs aren't particularly animation-friendly, I assume the longer turnaround time combined with the amount of animation being done here being much smaller than a full anime series lends some breathing room to the production of these scenes, and because of that, they stand out as one of the better visual elements at play in this game. Anywho, Kamaru's been trapped in an apartment building for a little over a year and some change, with no real knowledge as to why, but receiving food daily for her trouble. She was originally kidnapped and brought here during the tragedy that arose from Hope's Peak Academy, apparently around the time of filming of the Motive video we saw in the first game. During that time, she just kept ignoring the tragedy, hoping that it would de-escalate or go away, but as this series is quick to prove, despair rushes up behind you when you least expect it. She's quickly adapted to this way of life, but that isn't to say she really enjoys it much, and indeed she's become desperate for escape when one day rattling at the door signals to her that she may have something in that department to hope for. What she gets instead is a close shave in the form of a razor-sharp Monokuma claw burying through her door and promptly turning in an attempt to cut her into pieces. Before we get our first bit of gameplay, we also get a glimpse of the 3D rendered cutscenes, and these are… okay. The models don't look terrible, but the DR style converted to 3D does just look a bit inherently awkward, and the characters all have this somewhat awkward issue of always looking like they've got this protruding upper lip. Taking control of Komaru, we navigate around the pursuing Monokuma and escape the apartment building, allowing Komaru to see outside for the first time in a long time. And yeah, as you might expect, it's not looking great. We control Komaru in a third-person view, similar to, say, Resident Evil 4, although her model takes up quite a bit of on-screen real estate, which can make things a bit cluttered. I suspect this might have something to do with the fact that the game was originally released on Vita, but on larger screens it definitely feels a bit awkward. Trying to escape in the elevator, Komaru is quickly faced with members of the Future Foundation led by Byakuya Togami, who demonstrates the capabilities of his megaphone-shaped hacking gun by shooting the pursuing Monokuma and blowing it to smithereens. With no time to talk and only a command to escape and rendezvous with an agent across the street, Togami gives Komaru the hacking gun and instructs her to run if she wants to live. And yeah, there's little other choice in this situation as he stays behind to fight a swarm of oncoming Monokumas. Outside isn't much better. Monokumas flood the streets, massacring people left and right. The streets quickly piling up with body after body as smog fills the air and screams linger all around. It's kind of a nightmare, and although it's easy to miss the more sentient variety of Monokuma we've come to expect from these games, acting as a central and lead antagonist, it's equally as harrowing in a different way to see soulless, animalistic Monokumas marching around in droves, just killing indiscriminately, like they're feral animals with a natural lust for blood who can't be escaped from or reasoned with. As Komaru tries to rush into a restaurant and warn everyone, it too is quickly broken into by the Monokumas who begin killing left and right. A news reporter on the TV commands the people of this city, Toa City, to escape and take refuge. Faced with no option of remaining by the sidelines and hiding, Komaru takes on the role of all plucky girls in survival horror and decides she has to fight if she wants to live. This leads us into the main gameplay style of UDG, that being the over-the-shoulder shooting with the hacking gun. For right now, all we'll be using is the break bullet, which does just as it says, but we'll be unlocking different ammo types of varying functions and usefulness over the game's playtime. The main enemy type is, of course, Monokumas, who run and swipe at you and must be shot to be destroyed. Instead of being able to get headshots like in many other shooters, this game maps its critical hits to Monokuma's signature red eye, which is quite a bit more difficult to land a shot on than it may seem. The hitbox on this thing seems a bit inconsistent, though, as I can't tell you how many times I'm positive I landed a shot on it but didn't get the crit, or got the inverse result, shooting nowhere near the eye but somehow getting the crit anyway. For what it's worth, landing one will add additional power to your next shot, so there is that bit of satisfaction to take into account, but it's a hit and miss, no pun intended. After destroying the Monokumas in the restaurant, the news broadcaster is quickly killed by the Monokumas that invade the station, and Komaru witnesses something even more eerie. A group of strange children puppeting around his corpse, just like it's some kind of innocent game. The seeming leader of the kids, a girl with green hair who sits in a wheelchair, introduces them as the Warriors of Hope, and addresses the city, both claiming responsibility for controlling the Monokumas, and her intention to turn the city into a paradise for and by children, where all of the adults will no longer be needed. In other words, they're planning a massacre of every adult in the city, 
city. And this sudden invasion of Monokumas appears to be the method behind their madness. Quite troubling, to be sure. Meeting with the Future Foundation agent that she was told to find, Komaru finds him injured, and he tells her to get down to the park where there should be a helicopter to help her escape. Seeing another gaggle of Monokumas come in, all she can do is apologize for her inability to help him and rush on as he tells her to go, prioritizing her own survival in a situation where, already, it seems there can be very few heroes that live to tell the tales of their exploits. Here, there are only survivors. Reaching several agents in the park as mentioned, Komaru hears from them a bit about what's going on, or at least what they know so far. Of course, this is somehow related to the ongoing worldwide tragedy spurred on by Junko and Oshima, and exacerbated by her remaining remnants of despair, the cast of Danganronpa 2 still in their loyal lackey states. This place, Toa City, is an island owned by a huge IT corporation, which was apparently playing a huge role in rebuilding the world due to its existence somewhat away from mainland society. They're responsible for several inventions of note, including large air purifiers which made parts of the world, notably this island, livable again, clearing up much of the pollution that the tragedy created. The city has suffered much less damage overall because of this, and people all over the world are coming here to escape the tragedy's effects, making it of particular interest to the Future Foundation, who we know are trying to stop the tragedy once and for all. However, now it seems a mysterious riot has broken out, and these strange monokumas and children are the source behind it. As for the reason, even the Future Foundation doesn't know yet, but their biggest priority is helping people, like Komaru, escape so that they can regroup and plan a course of action. Before they can, however, they're descended upon by a group of children wearing strange monokuma helmets, heralding their own pack of feral monokuma-like beast robots, which maul the agents as Komaru tries to hurry into the helicopter. Unfortunately, all of the agents trying to help her are killed, and the helicopter is hijacked by Monokumas, who crash it into the streets. Surrounded by Monokumas, Komaru faints, and awakens after two whole days in a strange room. There, she meets a mysterious servant, who we should be all too familiar with even if he doesn't give us his name. Yeah, it's Nagito Komaida, and apparently he's been captured by the kids. The only reason he's even alive is evidently because he begged for his life. Remarking that he sympathizes with what a normal person Komaru is, he describes how much the situation has changed in only a couple of days and gives her back the hacking gun, which he's evidently nerfed a bit to make her adventure more interesting, saying she'll have the opportunity to upgrade it as she goes. Leaving, he tells her to be careful not to mention the gun in front of the kids if she wants to live, and now you're tasked with sneaking out to make it to the main room where they await you. To do so, you'll need to utilize the second type of bullet, Move, which is instrumental for puzzle solving and is really the only bullet that has unlimited ammunition. In this situation, it hacks the button needed to open the room door and will be used in the future on similar devices and switches. These hallways are pretty simple to navigate, but show us a bit of what to expect in terms of how navigation and exploration will work in this game, as well as giving us a bit more opportunity to fight Monokumas along the way. Upon finally reaching the main room, we get a proper introduction to all of the supposed Warriors of Hope themselves, and they're quite the colorful cast of characters. All of them apparently hail from a previously unmentioned branch of Hope's Peak Academy, appropriately named Hope's Peak Elementary School, a place where predictably gifted children are raised up into potential candidates of entry and research for the main high school branch. Our first kid to step up for introductions is Masaru Daimon, the self-identified leader and hero of the Warriors of Hope with the former title of Super Elementary School Level PE. He's predictably brash, overconfident, and sporty, seeming to constantly crave acknowledgement and admiration. Next is the vice leader in Sage, Nagisa Shingetsu, the ironically most adult-seeming of the group, who always has a rigid determination to stay organized and realize their dreams of paradise. Having been very academically gifted, his former title is that of Super Elementary School Level Social Studies. He even describes himself as the group's babysitter, only excluding Monica. Thirdly, we have the priest, Jotaro Kemery, a slow-spoken child with a strange mask who seems to have quite the raging inferiority complex and a wealth of oddball artistic interests. This is fitting, as his interest and skill in arts and crafts earned him the former title of Super Elementary School Level Drawing. He has a tendency to derail into unrelated subjects often and seems not to be very liked by any of his peers. Second to last, we have the fighter and resident extremely pink-looking character Kotoko Utsuki, who speaks in a mix of excitable ramblings and strange pop-cultural turns of phrase. This is evidently due to her longtime position and former title of Super Elementary School Level Arts Festival, or drama in the localization. As a constant fixture of the stage, acting culture is what she's most familiar with, and she claims to love cute things as well as… peeled chestnuts? Okay, girl, you do you, I guess. And of course, last but not least, we have the leader of the group, the green-haired and wheelchair-bound mage, Monica, whose former title was that of Super Elementary School Level Homeroom. Though she appears cheerful and childish, we know that someone rallying a group of kids together to do something like this 
can not only be what they appear to be on the surface, especially if the nice swastika-like pupils she's got going on are anything visually to go by in terms of hints toward her true nature. This is also juxtaposed somewhat brilliantly with the casting decision of Aya Hirano, who is the industry darling behind such universally loved characters as Haruhi Suzumiya and Konata Izumi, among many others. If we know anything by this point about how Danganronpa likes to use its celebrity casting to shock its audience, I'm sure we can come to expect quite a bit more from Monica than what she portrays on the surface right now. Restating their intention to make a paradise full of children and seemingly working to sate Monica's demands in a telling bit of fear, the kids make a proposition which Komaru is unable to refuse. They will be playing a game with her, where they are the hunters and she is their demon prey. This demon hunting game is apparently something they've already been hard at work at, a game where the Warriors of Hope release a certain target into the city and compete to see which one of them can kill them first. But how do they intend to do this? Well, by strapping a custom-made wristband to Komaru's arm, which will explode if she tries to tamper with it. This wristband will also constantly track her and provide information about her to the kids for their hunt. Though Shingetsu admits he'd rather get to work on their paradise than play games like this, he also concedes that it's what Monica wants, and so everyone has to give in. And in a moment that may denote part of her philosophy towards adults, and perhaps how they too have mistreated children, Monica stares pensively at Komaru and claims, In your current situation, you don't have the right to say a thing. You cannot choose your path. Dropping her through a hatch in the floor, Komaru feels a parachute expand behind her, the city skyline below her feet as she realizes that this entire time, she's been on an airship. As the kids celebrate the start of their plan, Monica remarks privately to herself that all that's left now is to wait for the despair. And by his lonesome, Komaida wishes good luck to who he views as the story's up-and-coming protagonist, ending the prologue. While I would definitely not say that this is a bad intro to the game, it certainly feels a bit more slapdash and disjointed than the intros of, say, Danganronpa 1 and 2. Komaru is a fairly likable protagonist from the get-go, and it's cool to see a Danganronpa game primarily feature a female protagonist for once, so there are no problems there. But there really hasn't been that much gameplay to really get our feet wet with yet. And though the cutscene presentation is fine, it has its share of weaknesses. Combined with the setup, which has, frankly, just a bit too much going on all at once, and this definitely makes for a less immediately compelling way to kick things off. The Warriors of Hope are interesting, I suppose, but they're a lot more vague and seemingly one-dimensional at this point than the comparatively instantly compelling Monokuma was. And though this premise has its promises of intrigue yet to come, I just don't think that it sinks its hooks in as immediately into you as something like the killing game does. That being said, this prologue does only clock in at around an hour and some change, which is about the shortest prologue so far, so perhaps that has something to do with it? We can only hope that both the story and the gameplay will expand in depth as we go, and the only way to find out if that's the case or not is to proceed into Chapter 1. Upon landing on the rooftops, Komaru is nearly ambushed by Monokuma's when she's saved by our partner in crime and buddy cop of this game, Tokufukawa of Danganronpa 1. Or, well, right now, she's actually saved by Genocider Show, who then, of course, promptly switches things back over to Fukawa once her hack and slashing is done. You see, Fukawa is apparently here on behalf of following Togami, not because she was given Future Foundation orders. In fact, the Future Foundation doesn't even trust her enough yet to make her a full-fledged member, treating her only as an intern who will have to prove she can handle her alter well enough to get their good graces, which is like... I mean, I get that Sho is a serial killer, that part's all understandable, but like I said in the DR1 video, the whole serial killer alter stereotype is seriously old hat and poor taste, and this added layer definitely doesn't make it look much better. Fukawa has even managed to learn a way to manually call Sho out whenever she likes by tasing herself, which is, of course, mainly just used for plot and gameplay convenience, but carries some somewhat unfortunate implications along with it nevertheless. Those are my obligatory complaints about this matter out of the way, though, because aside from that, stuff that was already a problem in the first game and only continues to be here, Fukawa is probably at her best in this game, and I'll get more into why as we carry along. This is also where you'll be given your first opportunity to test out playing as Sho. She's basically the game's sudden easy mode to switch to when you get overwhelmed, as she moves much more quickly than Komaru, and has very easily utilized hack and slash moves that far overshadow the hacking gun's capabilities. She also has special attacks which can wipe out large numbers of Monokumas at once. The only downside to this is that she has a battery meter which drains quickly while using her, meaning you can't just tank through things endlessly as Sho. And also, playing as Sho does pretty quickly get monotonous monotonous, rendering all sense of challenge pretty much null and void, and only leaving pretty dull button mashing. Of course, this is all optional, and you never really have to use show, aside from some very rare instances, but nevertheless, it does seem to cheapen the gameplay side of things just a bit. Anyway, from here on, we get our status quo and main goal for the time being established. 
Togami has been kidnapped by the Warriors of Hope after helping Komaru, and Fukawa is determined to rescue him. Komaru wants to get out of the city, and so for the time being, the two will team up, stick together, and try to get out of this whole mess through their combined efforts. Komaru's simple and polite personality brushes up quite entertainingly with Fukawa's usual moody antics, and they very quickly begin to build up a charming and funny senpai kohai like relationship with one another, with bits of flavor in the form of their differing interests, attitudes, and of course, Fukawa's usual over the top inferiority complex peeking in. Although I could deal without the localization's weird tendency to randomly add parts of lines to Komaru's dialogue to Fukawa that isn't originally there, usually lines that make Komaru seem more sarcastic or even derisive toward her, because heaven forbid we just have a character in this series who's unambiguously nice, I guess. Descending from the roof to get out of the hospital, we're introduced to the basic gameplay loop of Ultra Despair Girls in Microcosm, and though this is the easiest area we'll be encountering, it still gives us a pretty good idea of what we'll be doing for the next 16 odd hours, for better or worse. We'll be exploring areas in third-person, Resident Evil style, shooting Monokumas to defend ourselves, finding hidden notes or books to add flavor text or contextual information to our journey, and occasionally solving the odd puzzle or two. While the gameplay is functional, it can get pretty quickly stale, but the puzzles are usually pretty alright, if a little easy sometimes. We're also introduced to the Monokuman arcade machine rooms, which are basically little puzzle rooms with Monokumas patrolling around. The goal is to look at the overhead display and figure out how to fulfill the game rule properly using only the ammo type specified. The goal usually involves sneaking by, destroying all enemies in one shot, or other such things. While early machines may prove somewhat mindless or easy, these escalate in difficulty and complexity over the course of the game and honestly become one of the most unique appeals of UDG's gameplay loop in general. The only problem I find with these is that they're often not quite polished to the standard that you'd hope for them to be. Many times I'll have done exactly the sequence of things that the game wanted me to do, but will end up somehow arbitrarily missing one or two Monokumas in the final blast due to finicky AI or similar issues. This can necessitate a lot of retries, and while it doesn't prevent you from progressing in the story or anything, retrying brings down your end of chapter rank, resulting in you obtaining less Monocoins, and well, a lower rank if you care about that sort of thing. And this can be pretty frustrating when it feels that you have to do this through no fault of your own. Of course, if you get tired of the puzzles, you can also just switch to show and brute force violence your way through them, but completing the room via force and not how the game wants you to will also result in a lowering of your score, so it's worth trying to do it the right way, if at all possible. After getting out of the hospital, the duo decides to search through the hub world for a bridge that will hopefully lead out of town. On the way, they encounter bomb monokumas who, well, throw bombs. These are the first variant type of monokuma introduced throughout the game who all have different functions and styles of aggressing you, and they all have unique little properties to look out for in a fight, and their qualities will also become relevant in puzzle rooms from this point on. In the middle of battle, they're kind of annoying to deal with though, and these bomb monokumas in particular will just chuck explosives at you, which make trying to stand still and aim for them a little grating. Reaching a roadblock, they realize that they can only get to the other side of the road by entering and exiting a hotel, making this our second explorable area of the chapter. Inside, amidst all the usual destruction, monokumas, and corpses, we also continue to find more pamphlets and information about the city of Toa itself. Stuff about how they started as an ironworks company, who dominated 70% of the market and built up a large influence for themselves. Apparently, the founder, Tokushige Toa, invested in many businesses continuously for all of his life, never once going 20 days without establishing a new one, from the time he was 30 until his death at 64. With his seeming devotion at the center of discussion surrounding the city's prosperity, it only becomes a greater cause for concern as to why things turned out like this. Especially considering that another pamphlet reasons that Toa's technological strength was figured to be a high deterrent against the tragedy because the mastermind would not be able to overcome said strength. We also find hit list cards scattered about by the children describing other victims afflicted by the same wristbands as Komaru, who are being similarly hunted as demons. From what we can see of the first one, and many will find later, these are all people that are in some way related to or associated closely with the class of Danganronpa 1, with the very first being the father of Kiyotaka Ishimaru. Of course, while Komaru doesn't know any of these people, Fukawa shows more than a little recognition in her eyes when seeing many of them, though she keeps her comments largely to herself despite that. After solving a few more puzzles and avoiding some more monokumas, we escape to the street and find ourselves very close to the bridge. While there, we meet a pretty athletic boy who kinda seems to have a familiar vibe about him. Well, yeah, turns out this kid's name is Yuta Asahina, the younger brother of Aoi Asahina from the first game. He too has been given a wristband and released into the streets like Komaru, but wants to help in trying to find a way out and accompanies the duo across the bridge. 
Unfortunately, once they reach the other end, they realize it's been demolished halfway through, leaving it impossible to cross. The helmeted kids begin setting off bombs, forcing everyone to rush back the way they came and fight a wave of attacking Monokumas just to survive. Pushed to their breaking point, Yuta decides to tap into his sister's talents and try swimming from the end of the bridge, but it's at that moment that Komaru is forced to burn an image into her mind that she won't soon forget. If she hadn't learned that despair was the name of the game in this series yet, she's harshly made aware of this fact when Yuta's wristband begins to beep loudly, rapidly, and then explode. As the water rushes upward, raining down on Komaru and Fukawa both, they're made to, in a split second, accept that the young, eager boy that had been just talking about the possibility of escaping a few moments ago is now dead in the water. Komaru folds, having already witnessed horrific things, but never slowing down long enough so far to really let it sink in. And now that she has, she isn't sure if she can get back up. She isn't sure if she can face this. But rather unexpectedly, given what we've seen from her character in the first game, Fukawa speaks up to the contrary. It seems despite her thorny exterior, despite still lacking much confidence in herself, the end of the last game and everything she's had to live through since then really did teach Fukawa something. You gain nothing from averting your eyes from reality, she says, no matter how horrible or painful. Although I doubt you're even willing to listen in your state. If that's the case, at least run. You're saying that you're going to die anyway. So you're at least prepared, right? If you think you're going to die, at least run away. If you're wrong, you live. If you were right, then at least you die on the run and not just standing here, suffering. These words are barely something we can imagine the Fukawa of early DR1 saying, but at this point, it feels fitting for them to be coming from her. She's had a lot of horrible experiences that taught her lessons, sometimes in the hardest of ways, but that's also why she's able to speak to those experiences, and why you can really tell that they made an impact on her. This is why I love Fukawa, and why I think UDG does a lot for her character that other games in the series may not be as capable of tapping into. With the return of these cast members, we're given ample opportunity to see how they've grown and changed as a result of the experiences we've already seen them go through, and it's because of that that I think a story within this time frame wasn't at all without reason to be told. As the pair return to the city, determined to find another way, we're given our first opportunity to visit a skill shop. In the skill shops, you can buy one of two things, bling bullets or attack upgrades for Genocider. The first category is basically a catalog of adjectives to add on to any given ammo slot you have, things like beautifully, aggressively, completely, and so on. Attaching them in a combo that meshes well together to your truth bullet of choice will enhance its abilities in some ways. Although I'll be honest that these tweaks are so slight that it's a bit difficult to tell what they actually do by the end of the day, or at the very least they don't appear on the surface to be particularly necessary. The more clear subject of upgrade would be show's abilities, things like recharge time, combo attacks, speed, and etc. While this definitely helps make show more of a tank to use, that only makes her already overpowered arsenal of skills even more overpowered, so I'm not sure how much more interesting this in theory actually makes the game itself, considering the combat is already one of the least interesting and nuanced aspects of the gameplay so far. Adding additional abilities or stat boosts is, in part, something that can make your combat more interesting, but it does nothing to alleviate the issue of the combat itself being boring or stale just by virtue of including it. And unfortunately, I'd have to say the shop upgrades basically fall into this camp for me. On the surface, they appear to offer more nuance, but they can't make something inherently a bit shallow any more complex on their own. Well, speaking of nuance, though, we come into contact with another type of Monokuma right after this, that being the Siren Monokuma. These little gremlins will flash a big old police siren on their head when they notice you, drawing other Monokumas to the area and making encounters more frantic. The idea is obviously usually to get them out of the way first, or preferably from a distance so you can't get flooded with the backup they call. After dealing with our first one of them, we're given a new bullet type which will act as our common deterrent of choice against their antics, that being Dance. The dance bullet does just what it says on the tin. It distracts Monokumas from attacking you by forcing them to get jiggy with it. Using it on Siren Monokumas in particular, however, will basically turn them into a big shiny object to distract all the other Monokumas it calls. This means that they'll be all too distracted to attack you because they'll be observing Siren's killer dance moves. And honestly, this is a pretty funny weakness to give this particular variant of enemy. Unfortunately, the ensuing puzzle room to demonstrate this weakness also demonstrates the exact problem with the puzzle rooms that I was talking about before. You see, the idea is that I'm supposed to sneak to the side, afflict the Siren Monokuma with Disco Fever, watch as the others flock to him, then use Move on the nearby car positioned behind Siren so that it will roll forward and mow down all of them at once. 
I do all of that just as the game wants me to, and yet three times in a row it fails to kill one of the Monokumas in the process. Now, I finally got it on the fourth try, but that's essentially three retries, all of which lower my end of chapter score, and this is through no misunderstanding of the goal or misapplication of the abilities provided to me. I did exactly the same thing all four times, but it only worked correctly one of those times. What am I doing wrong here? In all honesty, nothing. I'm just not lucky enough for the game to work right in these instances unless I keep trying at it. And for an aspect of the game that clearly wants to reward precision and clever thinking, it's not very encouraging to keep screwing yourself on account of something that's basically out of your hands. Well, that aside, it seems we've got another problem to deal with. The subway underground that we want to reach to try to look for an alternate way out of the city is closed behind a locked shutter, and the station attendant's key is stolen by one of the Monokuma kids who forces us to tail him back through town for it. This leads not only to quite a few precarious skirmishes with Monokumas, but also forces us to return all the way back to the hospital. You know, the first area of the chapter? Ugh, yeah. I know this is a handheld title, so they probably couldn't afford to have another entirely unique level built for this part, but it doesn't really give off a super polished seeming vibe to have us backtrack to an area that we've already played in the very first chapter in order to pad things out. To give this revisit one positive though, it serves as our introduction to another variant Monokuma, the Junk Monokumas. These things are defective Uzumaki-esque abominations that have bulging eyes, gaping maws, gnarled limbs, and flail about rapidly on the ground trying to get close enough to maim you. They seem to constantly leak sickly brown fluid and take shot after shot to kill, which definitely makes them pretty intimidating to handle, especially with your slow aim. I'd say these things are the closest we get to truly traditional survival horror enemies in this game, and while they may not add any kind of particular gameplay nuance with their presence, their aesthetic uniqueness does at least add that much more of a creepy edge to this game's overall presentation that I honestly can't get enough of. You know what else I really like about this game's presentation? Some of the random notes you find on recently deceased people. It really adds a lot to the overall atmosphere of the game, and at least in passing, characterizes the sort of people you maybe aren't getting to know intimately throughout this town, but are still dying in droves around you. For example, there's this note elegantly titled, Monokuma Crushed My Leg, which reads, I don't think I can take another step. I know I can't take another step. I can't walk. Monokuma destroyed my leg and I can't move still around here, looking for me. I'm probably going to die. They're going to find me and kill me. But I can't keep thinking about that kind of thing. I have to think happy thoughts now. If I make it home alive, I want to go to the beach with my family. I want to see the sparkling water again. I want to sit on the sand with my wife and watch our beautiful daughter play. And if she trips and falls and gets a scrape, I want to say, there, there. It's okay, sweetie. No, I can't. I can't think about the future. I'm just going to die in a few minutes. I don't want to die, but I know I will. This is the worst feeling I've ever felt. There's a lot of soft subtlety to some of this writing, which makes it all the more disappointing when you get things directly after this, like Fukawa making degrading jokes about Komaru having a brother complex because she's too close to her brother, because they talk about their interests and hang out together sometimes. Real highbrow humor there, guys. Yes, casual references to incest are so funny. God. Well, at least the puzzle to get the key back is fun, and it makes use of a new truth bullet too. This one is called Detect, and lets us see hidden graffiti, usually wherever paint buckets are left. This can be used to find a lot of hidden things, such as the scrolls meant to be used to solve this puzzle, or hidden decals exposed if we shine our backlight on some hidden sparkle patterns we find out and about. Unfortunately, I still think Detect gets some of the least interesting use of the ammo types in this game, and that's a shame because I think with the less cumbersome way of using it, it could be integrated more heavily and more interestingly into the regular game design and shine all the more for it, but oh well, I suppose. On the way back after getting the key, we thankfully can take a shortcut so we don't have to tread back through the exact same overworld content again. We even get another arcade machine to do. Descending into the tunnels below, however, we don't encounter what we were hoping for, instead coming face to face with one of the Warriors of Hope, Masaru Daimon. And I'm sure you can guess where this is going, right? Colosseum, giant robot, allusions to a tragic backstory? Yep, this is the first of several chapter bosses we'll be facing in UDG that typically arrive at the end of each chapter. In the cutscene preceding the fight, we learn quite a bit about our hot-headed hero wannabe, too. If we weren't painfully aware of the damage the kids can do, he makes us very much aware by showing us the almost amalgamated pile of corpses he's accrued from his hunts, a sight so wickedly disgusting that it stuns Komaru into dead silence and leaves Fukawa unable to even look at all. 
When asking why and how he could even do something like this, Kamaru gives way to something building inside of Daimon though, something that reveals a bit more about the motivation behind these events, or at least the motivation for some to participate. He says he'd rather die as a kid than ever grow up to be an adult, jaded by the world, angry and violent. He says that acting as the hero to the kids, protecting them from the adults, helps him feel important, special and loved, needed. Breaking down into sobs, he laments how he will no longer need to feel scared. Not scared of the adults, not scared of the world around him, not scared of the dark, the pain, and the smell of alcohol. Realizing that his arms are shaking as he describes the presumed abuse he was put through at the hands of who we later discover is his own father, Daimon beats his arms repeatedly in an attempt to get them to stop, bruising them so badly that they change color. Convinced that he's abandoned all of his fear and that achieving the warrior's paradise will mean he never has to face that fear again, he summons a giant remote-controlled robot to fight with, the design almost perfectly befitting a Hero of Justice toy or Super Sentai-like figure that a boy his age would most certainly love. As horrifying as the sight of the bodies he's collected was, this reminds us just as quickly how he's just a child, who almost certainly has no capability to wrap his head around the full implications of what he's done, what he's doing. And now we know that much, if not all, of the fear he inflicts is an attempt to escape his own. It's easy to see why, if a kid like this was exploited for some horrible plot, they really could fall victim to something as horrible as this. This begins a thread in UDG which will remain important throughout, and I think the presentation here is certainly a bit more typical and on the nose than some of the later material, but it's no less pervasive a form of childhood abuse that, perhaps to a lesser extent of course, creates the behaviors and misaligned coping mechanisms we see in the warriors themselves. This theme surrounding childhood trauma and the extent to which a child can even be held responsible for something so vastly beyond their ability to fully understand will resonate deep down into the roots of this game's plot, and regardless of whether it's handled well in some parts or horribly in others, it's hard to deny that the game has a lot it wants to explore in regards to it. And I think that for Danganronpa, a series which has already so thoroughly explored the trauma of high school in particular, and the society that surrounds both our adult life and the stages of our preparatory education for it, that similarly exploring childhood and really going back to the origins of a lot of where this trauma takes hold both at school and at home really makes for a logical extreme of what we've been thematically building up in the series until this point. Everyone, in some manner or another, has been beaten down and made to feel fear, anger, and confusion from forces totally outside of their control, be it those of the workforce, society itself, the education system, or even our own families. I think regardless of mishandling, the fact that Danganronpa consistently tries to approach these issues in the first place is something I find worth recognition, if nothing else. Unfortunately, for all I can give praise to about this bit plot and tone-wise though, I can't really give the same kudos to the actual fight in the gameplay department. The fast-moving robot and the tactics at play in order to expose and take advantage of its weak point are just a bit too action-oriented, if that makes sense. What I mean to say is that Komaru's movement is very classic survival horror-esque. She doesn't have tank controls or anything, but she's not exactly super quick or swift. Her aiming is finicky and precise, her movement is a bit sluggish and easy to blindside, and honestly trying to quickly hit a target is not her strong suit when there's a lot of pressure and time sensitivity going on. While this isn't a huge problem here, considering this is just the first boss, you can only imagine this will only become more of a pain with later bosses as the difficulty ramps up, but Komaru's base movement capabilities, aim, and camera mechanics all largely stay the same. Not to exaggerate, but it feels a bit like trying to fight a Bayonetta boss as Harry Mason, if you get what I'm saying. It just doesn't feel quite like these things mesh stylistically speaking. Style aside though, when you finally manage to take him down, Daimon's defeat is signaled by the crowd of Monokuma kids suddenly violently grabbing him and pulling him off, his headphones dropping to the ground as his fate is left ambiguous. Yes, it seems the pack will only be pleased so long as you're the winner, and as the loser of the game, Daimon was punished. At least, that's what Fukawa speculates, and honestly, that just seems a bit cruel even for the kids. It was bad enough for them to be doing all of this in the first place, but to also toss their own out like trash once they'd ceased fulfilling their purpose? It's an all-new low. Returning to the surface, the girls discover some debris has been cleared away as a result of their thunderous fight underground, and agree to continue pursuing the subway through their newly exposed path. As they descend again, they're watched over by a mysteriously pure white-looking monokuma with bandages on it, ending chapter 1. Again, mirroring the prologue, I don't think this is necessarily a terrible introduction to the game. It serves its purpose well as a short-form summary of all of the varying aspects that you'll be expected to contend with over the game's runtime. However, for as much of the two-ish odd hours is spent on the cutscenes and dialogue, you'd think there'd actually be a bit more going on in this plot than this. 
While I certainly enjoy the dynamic between Komaru and Fukawa, we don't actually get much story development in this chapter aside from tiny bits of world building about the city we find ourselves in, and hidden items that not every player will go to the trouble of picking up, and bits and pieces in the middle and end. As much as I hate to say it, and as much as I do think it served a decent enough purpose in giving Komaru's development a place to start from, and Fukawa's a notable benchmark to observe from the first game, Yuta's death wasn't all that memorable to me by itself. Like sure, it totally sucks that he died, but all of the sadness I can potentially find myself feeling about it is purely because I know about his relation to another character that I already care about, but not because I care that much about Yuta himself. He's around for about all of five minutes, so the extent to which I'm really even able to care about him is unfortunately pretty limited. I don't fancy myself a heartless person, so I can find death itself sad on its own account, but in terms of character, there's not a whole lot to it that I didn't get from any other dead NPC's final notes I found scattered around, if that makes sense. I understand that because this game is more action-oriented that the story will be expected to take a tiny bit more of a backseat than usual, but considering the sheer amount of cutscenes and how often it stops gameplay for them, you'd think those cutscenes would actually provide a bit more than they ultimately do, and that's a big sticking point for me. Don't misunderstand, I know that a scene doesn't have to constantly precede the plot in order to be important. Character building is just as important as that, if not more in a lot of cases. And what a lot of people without writing experience will often call filler, is usually a pretty important part of fleshing out a world and its characters. But UDG feels like it's dragging its feet a bit often to be this early on into its proceedings, and that doesn't bode well for the future. What I find the most interesting so far about UDG at this point in the early game would be the potential that it has to craft fun puzzle rooms, if it refines finds its design for them, and also the potential of its plotline surrounding childhood trauma and culpability. If it continues to pursue those two aspects in interesting ways, I'd say this game still has more to provide me yet. However, its larger story aspects, and especially its explorative gameplay and base combat, are sorely lacking at this stage, and the game's padding is showing all the more for it. Let's hope things pick up by the time we've finished Chapter 2. The warriors mourn Daimon's apparent death after the end of the last chapter, but Shingetsu is rightfully skeptical. We never saw him die as an audience, and this series isn't very shy about letting us know when someone's kicked the bucket. Furthermore, according to their reports, he's at most missing. Unhappy with being questioned and seeming to conceal some deeper secrets about the matter, Monica chides Shingetsu for his queries, even questioning if he's becoming too adult in the process of both this and demanding greater focus on their paradise than the demon hunting game. Of course, this pulls him right back into line, and we watch both as Komaida is further bullied by the kids and as we return to the tunnels with Komaru and Fukawa. Said tunnels seem rather unassuming at first, even if Fukawa is scared of the dark. Soon enough, though, encounters with Monokumas are inevitable, even if rather unimposing. Eventually, we're faced, though, with Monokumas who have riot shields preventing us from shooting at them. Escaping them through the train cars, the ceiling begins to collapse, bonking Fukawa into show mode, and necessitating that we escape back the way we came. Great level design here. Confronted with a monitor carried by the Monokuma kids, the girls are put in contact with the central warrior that will be dominating this chapter's narrative, that being Jatiro Kemuri. I've got to say, both in Japanese and English, this kid's dialogue is just super slow. I know it's probably part of the character and an intentional choice, but it really does make all of his scenes just drag way more than they seemingly should. And as intrusive as the amount of cutscenes in UDG can be sometimes, this really isn't doing the issue any favors. Anyway, whether it takes him forever or not, he's here to tell us something important regardless. That it's a good thing the rebels stopped us from taking the tunnel out of town, because if anyone wearing the electronic wristband leaves the city limits, it will explode, explaining why Yuta's did so in Chapter 1. We're stuck here, and have basically no option but to wade through this hell and try to survive it, a realization that destroys Komaru's confidence in herself. That's not the only thing he wants to show us, though. He also shows us a giant Monokuma puppeting around the corpses of many people the kids are responsible for killing, making it just that much clearer how cruel and twisted they've been emboldened to act. This, combined with his tendency to treat all of these serious issues like a game continually, puts more and more fear and disgust into Komaru, culminating in Kemuri's defining question, do you hate me? While this ties directly into his character and trauma, as we'll continue to see, this also ties back into the theme I was discussing before. Again, at what point does a child become unable to dodge responsibility? At what point is a child fully capable of doing something like this without being able to fall back on the excuse of not being fully developed or knowing any better? And regardless of that, if a child does something malevolently cruel, should we really hate them? Is hating a child something we, as developed adults, should ever do? 
For what it's worth, though, Fukawa uses this chance as another opportunity to show us how much she's grown. Komaru says she's just a normal girl, so there's no way she could handle or do all this on her own. But Fukawa simply responds that because she can't do this alone, she'll just have to rely on Fukawa to help her, something that, while simple, is refreshing in how straightforward and kind it is. Reminds you that there's something to hold on to here. Of course, encouraged as we are, above ground still doesn't seem safe, with the Monokumas and kids having some kind of impromptu rave. So we're forced to go a different way underground, and at this point we finally get some ammo that can deal with those pesky riot shield Monokumas, Knockback, which does exactly what it says on the tin, knocks enemies back. In the case of shield types, it will make them drop said shields, leaving them vulnerable to an actual attack afterwards, so that's neat. A bit context sensitive, but as we'll see later, this will come in handy for more reasons than just that. Noticing that there seems to be a difference in the way some of the masked children act, based on how some will parade around bodies and others won't, the duo descends further into the tunnels. After collecting some books and solving some puzzles, we come across someone being attacked by Monokumas under a tarp. Moving to save them, we receive gratitude from the victim, that being the strange pure white Monokuma we saw at the end of chapter one. While the two are obviously suspicious of him, this cheerful soul by the name of Shirakuma claims he's not bad news at all. And his saturn sweet shtick does prove somewhat convincing, even if right away you notice, how his voice might be a bad sign. What do I mean by that, by the way? Well, Shirakuma is voiced very obviously, might I add, to those who have played this series in Japanese all the way up until this point, by Megumi Toyaguchi, who while she's more arguably well known for parts like Winry from Fullmetal Alchemist or Yukari from Persona 3, is also the voice of Mukuro Ikusaba and Junko Enoshima in this very series. So yeah, color me unsurprised if you remain skeptical of the little guy. Skeptical or not though, the fact of the matter is that in exchange for saving him, he's offering to lead us to a place where survivors are hiding away from the eyes of the children, a safe haven that they haven't found out about yet. As mistrusting as Fukawa is of this, Komaru wants to check it out for herself, and so the journey through the sewers to reach it begins. Well, as soon as we get a little bit of background out of him, that is. That being that he's determined to save people, and is apparently powered to do so by an AI that he runs off of. Though who put said AI into him, and for what reasons, he can't recall. The next while of this chapter has you roaming the sewers to find the hideout as Shirakuma guides you, and I'll be honest, this section is really boring. The locale is not at all appealing, it's extremely samey looking and gets very visually dull after only a few minutes. Furthermore, you'll be tasked more than once with taking on an enemy swarm type encounter where your job is to prevent Shirakuma from being killed by Monokumas for a certain amount of time. A glorified escort mission, in other words. And I don't know about you guys, but I feel the term escort mission gets thrown out as a negative quite often precisely because nobody likes to do them. And I am no exception. I hate them. Look, I already have enough trouble watching out for myself in video games. I do not need the extra stress of preventing an NPC from dying, especially one that just sits there and takes it. At the very least, you get some fun opportunities to use your knockback on Monokumas to send them toppling down into the water, and can also get Shirakuma to search little tunnels and open doors for you. So there's not no variety going on here, it's just very little compared to what I would hope for. Upon finally reaching the hidden base, we find out several interesting things. First of all, apparently when the Monokumas first appeared, the research into what they were and who manufactured them was being led by the Toa group. Second of all, there is a woman here who will help and send people after any of the people whose hit list cards we happen to pick up. Her name? Hiroko Hagakure, once divorced, currently single, age secret, and yeah, she's definitely the mother of the first game's Hagakure, something Fukawa already notices pretty quick, but there's even more evidence for it that kinda gets swept by in the localization. You see, in the localization, a very particular quirk of how Hagakure referred to people was lost, that being the tendency to add chi onto the end of their surnames. Things like Naegichi, Fukawachi, and Kirigirichi were common to hear him saying, so in the localization of UDG, Hiroko simply affectionately nicknames the duo Koko and Fufu, while in the original Japanese she calls them Komaruchi and Fukawachi with Fukawa asking why only she had her last name used. This is sort of a meta joke because normally she would use just last names, like her son did, but Naegichi is something we as an audience would already be used to hearing used to denote Makoto Naegi from the first game, so Hiroko uses Komaru's first name instead. It's a fun little callback. No time to stand around reminiscing though, we have to head into the main building as advised by Shirakuma. Apparently if we wait around here for a bit, we'll get a chance to talk to the Resistance's leader and potentially team up with them somehow. While we wait, we can check the lockers to read several of the adults' journals, many descending into madness and vitriol as they succumb to their pain and anguish, and very often their hatred towards the children, whom many decide they want to kill after all they've been put through by them. See a recurring theme here? 
Well, anyway, when the leader finally arrives, it's this guy, Haiji Toa, who, excuse me for a second, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you, who, as you can probably tell by his surname, sucks. I mean, is actually part of the Toa group who formerly controlled the city. Yeah, the current CEO is his dad, or, well, was his dad, before he was murdered by the children, apparently. His bandaged arm is a result of Monokuma's attacking him, and he admits he has no idea how to combat the children, or even a plan to do so. All he can do now is stew in his misery, vow to come up with something when the time is right, and curse the children, saying that they're no longer kids, but devils. Evocative words for all the wrong reasons, when you consider the kids' own inclination to call the adults demons, and use that as an excuse to purge them. It's just as Shirakuma said directly before this, call it a crusade or a mission or whatever else you want, but a conflict like this is war, no matter how you look at it. And war inevitably brings with it a mountain of bodies and an inescapable haze of misery and death. The hatred felt by the children for the adults, the hatred felt in turn by the adults for the children. Will either of these things ever be resolved through further violence or hatred? Or will it simply turn itself into an endless loop of despair and revenge? Well, at the very least, Fukawa's heard enough whining from Haiji after only a few minutes of talking to him to decide this leader's got nothing to offer them or the people hoping he'll be their hero. Of course, none of this matters anyway, because even if Haiji weren't bound to reject them based on Fukawa correctly pointing out his flaws, he certainly does after learning that Fukawa is a member of the Future Foundation. Why he harbors a hatred for them is unclear, but he seems to view them as at least unreliable, and demands that they leave, refusing to cooperate with them. As the adults watch in horror, seeing a broadcast where the kids torture their loved ones, the duo catches a night of sleep in the shelter before resolving to head back out the next day. Thankfully, they're not aimless, as Shirakuma gives them a laptop he managed to scavenge from the surface, hoping that they might be able to take it to the highest level of Toa Tower, subvert the citywide signal jammer, and contact the Future Foundation for help. It's not much, but it is a plan at the very least, and we definitely need one of those right about now. Emerging from the sewers into a graveyard, we head to the tower. The city around us turned into a graffiti-esque wonderland of childish aesthetic sensibilities. Honestly, compared to the sewers, this is a much better locale already. It really does a good job balancing the over-the-top eccentricity involved in the children's actions, but also juxtaposes it well against the grim and heinous reality of bodies littering the boardwalks and people cowering in corners, lamenting the loss of their loved ones. It's this kind of aesthetic strength that Danganronpa has always been excellent at, and it's times like these that I'm reminded you DG hasn't entirely lost that touch, even containing it in spades in some places. The puzzle rooms here aren't bad either, introducing us to a hologram projector that we'll be using for some in the future. It's an interesting mechanic, I suppose, though admittedly its function is a bit too similar to the dance function on Siren Monokumas to seem truly original. Once we finally arrive at the tower, we can't go in right away. First, we're ambushed by Kemery, who unleashes a crowd of Monokumas for us to fight. This isn't the first time we've had a primarily combat-based section where we have to fight off a wave of these things, but they've usually been much shorter than this one is, and had less enemies to deal with. I understand Escalation is the name of the game here, and an expected amount of difficulty curving isn't uncharacteristic of a game like this, but like I said, UDG's combat is one of its weakest aspects, which really starts to become more painfully obvious when sections like this come about. This movement is just not really made for frantic or exciting combat, and becomes both taxing and cumbersome when presented as such. The only way to make it easier on yourself is to switch to show at times like these, and like I said, show's gameplay is mechanically mindless as all hell, so even though doing so would certainly make things easier on you, it won't make them much more interesting or fun to play. Speaking of taxing, once we get inside, we realize that we have no card to activate the elevator, so we have to start climbing the endless stairs on foot. We can't get up them first without encountering a new type of Monokuma though, who is objectively the funniest kind. Ball Monokumas. These hulking Kirby Bear looking creatures waddle around and can attack you by rolling, but more often than not will basically just vomit trash at you which obscures the screen and makes it harder for you to see. Shooting them in the eye is a good way to kill them, but if you use knockback on them from behind, you can also roll them in the direction that they're pointing, which is made clever use of for some puzzles in this section and beyond. As we explore, we fight more Monokumas, solve more puzzles, find more notes praising Tokuichi Toa for taking charge of the city in the wake of the tragedy, and even find out from some notes that some adults have begun to suspect that the Future Foundation is involved in the riots, but before we can truly ponder that much longer, we come across another companion bound to their ill fortune by a wristband like our own. This older gentleman seems to be a programmer trying to see if he can use a spare laptop to hack his wristband off, to no success. From the looks of him, we series veterans should already have a general idea of who he is, but when he mentions he has a child who he was separated from, 
the trend we've already been experiencing should make it obvious. This is in fact the father of Chihiro from the first game, and it's pretty heartbreaking to see him worry about his kid as Fukawa can only turn away from him, a look of horrific recognition on her face, as we know that he'll never see said kid ever again. Well, in any case, once he hears of our plan, he decides to tag along, thinking that if we can take him back down the few floors we scaled safely, he can hack into the elevator's card reader to help us shoot all the way to the top without having to climb an endless amount of stairs and risk even more Monokuma encounters. His plan is a sound one, but the process is made pretty urgent when a swarm starts to attack as he begins his hacking, and unfortunately we can't breathe easy when he finishes either. Sure, the elevator finally opens, but when it does, he's immediately set upon by a pack of beast Monokumas who maul him relentlessly. Though Sho quickly takes them out, even her power isn't enough to save the man in time, as he lays on the floor, bleeding out as he laments that he wasn't more help to us. In that moment, Komaru sees a picture sticking out of his shirt pocket, a picture of him and Chihiro together before the hopes begin ceremony. He looks so proud, happy. It's crushing to even think of like this, but one can't help but wonder if the man dodged one final bullet by remaining ignorant to his child's fate, even at the very end of his life. Consumed by grief, by anger toward the children for what's happened, Komaru is faced with another unexpected challenge as the elevator halts. When the duo forces the door open, they're met with another Colosseum-like room, and we know what's going to happen now. We've got to face the Warrior of Hope, Jetaro Kemery, in a battle for survival. In the process, we learn that he was forced to wear his mask every day of his life by his mother, a mother who constantly convinced him he was ugly, undesirable, and worthy of nothing but hatred and shame. Of course, when asked if he wants revenge against the adults for how he was treated, he claims it's nothing as cheap and silly as that, just a desire to change the world, and in said world, demons aren't needed. Enraged, Komaru steps forward, declaring that whether child or adult, their actions are unforgivable, and sneering, Kemari remarks that her eyes are finally full of hatred. Declaring that when you're hated by everyone, you no longer have anyone's standards or expectations to live up to, Kemari faces us in battle, convinced that by being truly hated, he's free. Just as things are about to start, he gives us one last thing to chew on. That the one who inspired them all to do this, the one who loved and appreciated them more than anything, and the one who the adults selfishly took away from them, bringing about their own doom in the process, was someone he calls Big Sis Junko, and oh boy, who saw that one coming? As usual, the boss is not very good. It has an easy enough pattern to figure out, using knockback on the bombs it spreads to stun it and leave it vulnerable to regular attacks, but the way the camera behaves in this game really fights you on this one. It barely ever wants to actually focus on said bombs right away, and by the time you manually fix the camera on them, you're likely to miss the extremely slim window of time you have to even shoot them before they blow up in your face. It's pretty annoying. Aside from that too, it's just really easy, like it's not very mechanically interesting all things considered, so the challenge comes less from the actual boss design, and more from the frustrating lack of polish on the game's actual mechanics themselves, which doesn't make it actually seem more fulfilling, just like an even bigger waste of your time. Upon being defeated, Kemery is of course dragged away by the kids and beaten to a pulp, but not before his mask is torn from his face, revealing the stunning truth that he looks completely normal. That doesn't endear him to anyone though, especially not Komaru, who's still letting her anger get to her, remarks that it serves him right, something that gives Fukawa a bit of pause. This is a very important narrative beat, honestly, in my opinion, because it shows just how easily someone in a situation like this would inevitably fall into that mindset, the mindset that Haiji, most of the adults of the shelter, and plenty others in their final notes have shared. A growing hatred for the children that begins to justify cruelty or even violence towards them in retaliation for what's happened here. Is that the right direction, though? Well, it's something to continue wondering about, nonetheless. Returning to the elevator, they continue their ride to the top when they finally reach their destination. Fukawa whips out the laptop and attempts to get it connected. Though things are fuzzy for a moment, eventually the feed finally gets going, putting Komaru successfully in contact with a member of the Future Foundation. And of course, it's none other than her older brother, Makoto Naegi. And this ends Chapter 2. Though quite a bit of important story material is set up in this chapter, the gameplay definitely suffers for it. While the locales do have a bit more to them in terms of scope and exploration than the previous chapters, the sewer in particular really drags and is pretty hideous and dull. Toa Tower is better and more visually varied, but the puzzle rooms aren't much more engaging than usual and seem to have stagnated here in terms of clever design. The new enemy and ammo types are cool, but nothing unfortunately to write home about despite how funny Ball Monokuma admittedly is. And again, my sadness in witnessing Dad Fujisaki die has less to do with him himself, since we only knew him for five minutes, and more to do with the sadness he reminds me of in regards to Chihiro. 
At the very least, though, I do feel like a lot of material effort has gone into this chapter in terms of continuing the interesting narrative revolving around the children, their goals, and the adults' growing hatred of them. It provokes some interesting but uncomfortable thoughts and questions to be asking about all this, and for what it's worth, I actually think the material at hand does a decent job at begging said questions. Shirakuma, while seemingly sweet, is another element to toss into the fray that yields questions too, and his voice should certainly keep us on our toes if nothing else. UDG isn't really stepping boldly forward with this chapter, if anything it's kind of standing in place and dragging its feet, but at the very least it's continued to manage making me think, and if nothing else that's at least something I can give props to a game for doing. One can only hope things at least get more interesting from here. A quick warning before we move on though. We're moving into the chapter 3 discussion now, and despite the fact that I'm going to keep discussion of said subject as brief as I possibly can, Chapter 3 very heavily features a character whose backstory involves CSA. Though there are a few occasions where the subject matter is treated somewhat respectfully, there are many more numerous occasions where, I'll be frank, it's treated absolutely horribly, and it's easily the worst chapter in the game narratively because of this, in my opinion. Considering the extremely sensitive subject matter at hand, and the fact that it's so gravely mishandled, I'm going to be putting a timecode on the screen now for when the Chapter 4 discussion starts. At the beginning of it, I'll go ahead and very briefly summarize the plot footnotes from Chapter 3 unrelated to this topic that you missed, so that you won't have to be confused if you skip there. That being said, I wanted to go ahead and give my audience an opportunity to decide whether they were truly comfortable with that or not, and wanted to ensure that those who weren't had a way to opt out. Please take care of yourself, and if you're watching this video premiere live, I encourage you to please dip out if you can't handle this sort of thing. If you want to come back afterward, you're more than welcome. And with that being said, let's get this out of the way, shall we? While Kamara's conversation with her brother is pretty charming, and also allows us to get a glimpse of some of those old DR1 dynamics resurfacing, it also proves pretty enlightening. After recapping his sister very quickly on the events of the first game, Naegi clarifies, as we might have begun to suspect, she wasn't the only prisoner in a Toa apartment. Apparently everyone with a wristband were hostages taken back during the first game, hidden away for the sake of using them for another future motive, where they would have been forced into a killing game with each other to bring their own relatives further despair. However, before before this motive could be utilized, the class defeated Junko, leaving the hostages in the apartments. It seems that they were still being looked after, as Junko wished, by the remaining remnants of despair, and the Future Foundation received a tip-off to the hostages' presence here just before the riots broke out, meaning it was probable that they were used as bait to entrap the Future Foundation somehow. Seeing as we know the remnants will willingly engage the Foundation in battle later on, even willingly submitting themselves to the Neo World program for the sake of sabotaging it with the guidance of Izuru Kamakura, this makes sense. Given in the time frame, this would fit their motives quite well. Though Komaru begs to be rescued by the Foundation, Naegi admits that he fears intervening would get the hostage Togami killed, and Fukawa is absolutely against even taking a chance of risking that, even going so far as to threaten Komaru's life if Naegi comes swaggering recklessly into the city. At just that time, the kids, having figured out the transmission was going down, extend the signal jammer and knock out the building's power, successfully cutting off the call and leaving the two back on their own to escape from the tower. It seems like whether she likes it or not, Komaru has no choice but to fight. We then have to actually sneak around in the dark for a bit, following footprints with Detect to navigate our way out, all the while being confronted with Monokumas who surprise us from the shadows. It's an interesting lean towards the survival horror aspects of the game, but it's nothing particularly special. Though a Monokuma kid tries to blow them up and seal an exit, they manage to find a bomber Monokuma near a wall to blow their way out of the top floor and descend using the emergency ladders. Back with the Warriors of Hope, Monica decides she's bored of doing impromptu funerals, and for the most part leaves Kemori unmourned. When Utsugi questions her, she again throws a fit, intentionally triggering Utsugi's trauma by using the word gentle to describe her, a word that she often heard thrown around when she was assaulted by her producers as a child actress. Oh boy. This is obviously a super uncomfortable subject, but to be entirely fair to the game for a second, in this scene, we'll get to the other less tactful ones later, it's depicted exactly as I would hope something so serious would be. It's not shown, it's mostly implied, and it doesn't fetishize the situation or try to turn it into some horrific source of titillation for the audience. This is unquestionably the source of some deep-seated trauma for a child, and her ensuing breakdown into sobs and screams communicates that, while uncomfortably, 
extremely efficiently. It also goes to show even further just what kind of leader Monica is, not to only know this about Utsugi, but to deliberately use it to break her will and force her to fall into line. She even begins to hit her repeatedly, saying that at the very least, Utsugi can count on Monica not to be gentle. Which in a very twisted way, you can see someone, especially a child in such a vulnerable position, deferring to someone like this out of both resentment toward their own circumstances and fear of the consequences for not doing so. Combining her violence and intimidation with comfort and supposed understanding standing, Monica crafts the perfectly toxic environment necessary to turn a victim like Utsugi into a fearful, loyal servant of her agenda. And it's all the more believable, too, because of these factors, that Utsugi would fall prey to thinking her world would be perfect if only adults didn't exist. Adults preyed upon her, others turned the other way and allowed it to continue. In her eyes, and especially at her age, what would ever constitute an innocent adult after that point? Well, Shingetsu seems to come in at the wrong time, demanding they get to work and reporting his sabotage of the girl's transmission. He also announces a plan to take advantage of the two to lure and massacre the resistance movement. Though Monica briefly seems to put the moves on him again, they turn their attentions to a figure they say they're allowing to speak once more, a purely black Monokuma with gold teeth and a big cigar named Kurakuma, who appears to be a loudmouth who can't stop yammering. He is also voiced by Megumi Toyoguchi, and if this has your interest piqued about his possible ties to a certain pure white bear, well, you're thinking in the right direction. Trying to escape the tower, the girls encounter an admittedly pretty fun puzzle, but soon afterward also encounter what I consider the worst type of puzzle room in the game. These rooms have patrolling beast monokumas walking by capsules, which you must stealth around near to find which one has a singing child in it. The whole thing takes ages and is tedious as all hell, and of course getting impatient and just killing the things with show will get you a rank deduction, so if you want a good score, you're gonna have to put up with it. I hate these, easily the worst variety of puzzle in the entire game. As they escape the tower, Fukawa's abrasiveness finally starts to wear thin on Komaru. As positive a person as she is, even she can't help but get offended when, after being faced with an unexpected threat from someone she respected, said person also says she's done nothing at all for herself which is definitely uncalled for after everything she's done to try to stand up for herself. Sure, she has been scared and reluctant the entire time, but she's also risen to the challenge when she had no other options, and it's here where a divide begins to open up between the two, testing whether Komaru can hold on to her respect for Fukawa and whether Fukawa can finally learn the social skills necessary to offer a genuine apology. While it's disheartening now to some extent, it will provide a good basis for strengthening their individual characters, especially Fukawa's given her difficulty since even the first game with trusting others and opening up to them. As Komaru heads back to the Resistance base, we pile through a few more puzzle rooms before getting a new bullet type, the Paralyze Bullet. Paralyze uses electricity to basically stun Monokumas in a line, and if they're standing in water, it will electrocute every single one who happens to be standing in it. While it's pretty standard in use on its own, the property it has with water is admittedly used in some clever ways at times, particularly within puzzle rooms as we move forward. Upon returning to the base, they try to talk to Haiji again, but the adults in the meeting are all on the same page. There's nothing they can do, but if they could, they'd just kill the children. Seeing what we have so far, it's obvious that the kids are doing horrific things, but even more than that, it still seems unclear whether that could ever be an acceptable solution. Even now, once out of her earlier situation, Komaru doesn't seem as concretely sure of her seething hatred anymore. The disaffected adults also note that though they believe it's just because they hate their parents to a pathological level, the kids have only left survivors who don't have children, which is something to keep in mind for the future at least. As Fukawa once again chides Haiji for his weakness in holding up and repeatedly saying they need to wait for the right chance, Komaru fires back, saying someone who isn't weak could never understand the plight of the weak, to which Fukawa also takes umbrage, saying that she's always been weak, but just decided to do something about it after witnessing the horror of the killing game, implying that this definitely touched a nerve. Before they can argue further though, the base is attacked by Monokumas. It seems Shingetsu's plan was to trail the two back to the base, and they successfully did so. Forced to throw herself into combat to protect those she can, Komaru runs out, and honestly, this fight is awful. It's narratively gripping to some extent, I suppose, but it turns into like a six-fold escort mission, mechanically speaking, and given that the map is so big, Komaru's movement is so clunky, the NPC's health is so sparse, and your running speed is so slow, the whole section is bad no matter how you slice it. Even if you slice it, show doesn't alleviate this much either, as the battery will probably drain before you finish, and even then, like I've kept repeating, her variety of 
combat is boring. Well, predictably, despite how much they did to help and put their own lives at risk to do so, all Hayashi can do afterward is scream at them for letting themselves get trailed, which, like, sure, it wasn't the smartest thing in the world, but they obviously didn't mean to and did what they could to make up for it while putting their own lives in danger to do so. Like, it's more than you're doing for anyone, bro. Didn't see you out there helping anyone who was being attacked. Restrained and locked up in their rooms, Komaru is unexpectedly broken out by Utsugi, but it soon becomes clear that her motives aren't pure. And this is where things get bad. Utsugi is here to break Komaru out because she's adorbs, her words not mine, and she figures she'll exact some revenge for her trauma by reenacting it on someone else, which, uh, not a thing I think I need to say would be horribly disgusting to write about a child victim of that sort of thing. Furthermore, while her denture launcher she uses to sedate Komaru is seemingly a reference to her father, a dentist who constantly committed infidelity while his wife sold her and her own child's services to creepy men, Utsugi describes it with very deliberately suggestive language, and again, I don't think I need to say that this just isn't acceptable material to write for a character who's literally an elementary schooler, not to mention an abuse victim of this nature. It's sick. And the thing that really sucks the most about this is that the scene introducing this trauma earlier was handled rather respectfully, or at the very least handled with enough restraint not to be considered completely tasteless, which is kind of impressive considering that this is Danganronpa. You can even still see some hints of a well-handled character arc going on here with some of Utsugi's dialogue. Being adorbs isn't always a good thing. Cute girls go through terrible things. And if you're adorable too, you have to protect yourself on your own. If you can't, you have to take whatever they give you. It's a shitty rule, but I didn't make it. Adults did. See, that right there, that's a good line. It reinforces everything about her beliefs, everything about her trauma, and it's honestly kind of biting. Despite how horrible it is, how often do we unfortunately hear about things like this happening to kids? Even once is too much, but we hear about this sort of thing upsettingly often. It's the kind of thing you could absolutely see molding at least one of the Warriors of Hope into the kinds of fearful, vengeful children they are today. And it's this potential that makes the way the rest of this plotline is handled so much more disappointing and gross. Because it doesn't stop there, oh no. We haven't even seen the worst of it yet. The worst of it follows, well, after we see Fukawa finally fall prey to a sneeze leading to Sho breaking out of her cell. Receiving her items and GPS tracking to Komaru's location by some of the Monokuma kids, she gives chase. At this point, we are made to do a frankly horrific minigame, which I will be refusing to show actual clips of, where Komaru is strapped to a giant coffin-like board by Utsugi and grabbed at by extending cartoon glove hands that she controls. The whole thing is framed like she's in danger of being stimulated, and the minigame instructions even try to make gaffes about how the player is being interrupted while they're busy. This is disgusting, flat out. The fact that there is a fan service minigame about assault, perpetrated by a victim of assault, who is also a child, is maddening to me. How they could seriously have started this chapter with such promise and then tanked it into the absolutely most vile low of lows is beyond sickening, and there is simply no excuse for it. This ruins the game flat out for many people, and honestly, I see why. It's exploitative, it's grody, and it's the kind of thing I would hope gets you put on a watch list instead of a best game developers list. The following sequence where Sho saves Komaru isn't much better either, having you attack Utsugi while sections of her clothes fall off. Of course, they never take it to the end of that process, but it still doesn't make it any less sick, especially when they try to play it up for laughs by having Utsugi make a fourth wall breaking joke about how, hey, ESRB, don't worry, I'm 18, so this is cool actually, like, shut up. People talk, and justifiably so, about the glaring shift from Persona 5's first 20 hours with Kamoshida to everything else after it, Try Ultra Despair Girls. Even at the most desensitized I ever was as a teen playing this game for the first time, I could only balk at the fact that they were seriously doing this, and put the game down for quite a while afterward. Anyway, it goes without saying, but I hate this section with a fiery passion, and especially the fact that every time it's referred to after this, it's recalled as some bit of embarrassing comedy at Komaru's expense. It is abysmal. Now let's move on before I give myself an aneurysm. Thanking Sho for the save, Komaru is surprised because she thought her fight with Fukawa would mean that she wouldn't come after her. Uh, well, that's not Fukawa girl, you might want to have learned that by now, considering that you're trying to get close to her and all. You know Sho is literally an independent developed person because that's how DID works, right? 
Well, either way, we still have a robot boss to fight, so let's get it out of the way. Utsuki argues that no matter who they call innocence, she can't see the good in adults like that either because nobody ever helped her escape her circumstances, which is, again, a convincing bit of character building. Fukawa unknowingly uses Utsuki's trigger word again, and the scene that ensues is honestly about as well handled as the first was. Utsugi crumbles, bringing out her robot less like an imposing source of offense, but more like a desperate form of defense, claiming that if anyone were to treat her gently, she'd rather they just kill her instead. While this does nothing to bring me back around on the completely unacceptable previous scene, it at least doesn't make it any worse, and brings the trauma depiction right back out of the inappropriately comedic tone it had been trying for until now, so I can comfortably remain numb. The actual mechanics of how the boss is fought are a bit more clever than the last few, too, admittedly, requiring you to use Paralyze on the Monokumas in the water while up on the dry area. Doing this while Utsugi's axe is down causes a chain reaction that stuns the robot, leaving it vulnerable to attack. Again, the biggest source of difficulty in this boss actually managing to be fun is in the poor control and speed of the camera, which turns much too slowly for the quick action being demanded of you most of the time. At the very least, though, it's trying to be a more clever and interesting boss fight than before, so I'll give it some points for that much. Upon defeating the robot, it seems Utsugi is about to be dragged off similarly to the other warriors upon their defeat, but before the kids can hound her with hands, Sho decides on behalf of all of us in the audience that that would be just a bit too much after all the prior context we've received, and swiftly knocks Utsugi defensively out of the way, which I have to say, while it again doesn't make up for everything else, is genuinely kind of a relief to see. I genuinely did not want this child to suffer any more than she very evidently has. But now what? Shingetsu approaches, admonishing them for bullying Utsugi. When Kamaru responds that she sympathizes with the children but still believes they shouldn't kill people, Shingetsu's response is easy to miss but honestly very interesting considering this game's ongoing themes. He asks if they're saying the kids should just take it, if they should abandon all hope. It's easy to get lost in the typical Danganronpa platitudes and associate all this chaos with the trademark despair that Junko so loved, but to these kids, this act of rebellion, this wanton murder, as horrible as it obviously is, to them, it's security, it's safety, and it is their hope. One person's despair could be another's hope, and in that sense, they're not just two sides of the same coin, they're so deeply intermingled that they can't possibly exist without the other. And given all of the reliance and trust that we've put into hope over the course of this series, only to see it twisted and now even further subverted here, I think Danganronpa is trying to get us thinking about these concepts in a deeper way than its overuse of the terms would at times imply. To that end, Shingetsu does something truly unexpected to close the chapter out with. Claiming that the Paradise plan was going smoothly until Kamaru and Fukawa got involved, he promises a bargain. He'll disable the wristband and let them both go if they promise to leave the city and just leave the kids to their own devices. As we're left hanging on whether Kamaru will accept this offer, we pull out to see Monica near a large scrawling she's made, a seeming ritualistic circle made to honor Junko and Oshima, as Kurokuma anticipates along with her the coming of a successor. A second generation Junko to herald a new era of despair. Ending chapter 3. As I'm sure you can tell, this chapter conflicts me a lot. While there are some good puzzles and more than a few interesting story and thematic bits to chew on here, the latter depiction of Utsugi's trauma and the subsequent minigames set around it are horrendously tasteless. The most good faith reading of the developer's intent here I could possibly muster is that they were perhaps starting to think that the scene was too dark and required some levity in order to prevent it from becoming too depressing. But even if that's the case, their attempt at humor was not only not funny, but so disgustingly exploitative and off-color that it only made the scene worse, not even anywhere close to better. This section of the game is honestly one of, if not the most unacceptable parts of the franchise, and if this alone sealed the fate of the game for some, I would not blame them. As many interesting ideas as I think UDG is capable of bringing to the forefront sometimes, with even some of its best yet to come, walking away at this point is a 100% reasonable reaction to have when a game stoops this low, and it's not something I can even pretend to forgive. This is a permanent stain on this game that should always, without exception, be disclaimed for what it is, and no amount of otherwise good content surrounding it can make it any less repulsive. I do still have some good things to say about this game, but it's important that you know I could never just let something like this glaze over me. I expect better from Kodaka and the DR team than this trite, and so should you. I don't think we should ever let them forget that.
Hi there, people who skipped ahead. What happened in chapter three, you ask? Good question. Nagi told Komaru that she was trapped in the apartment because Junko stored her and other relatives of the DR1 cast for a potential motive that went unused when she went defeated. They were kept alive until now by the remnants of despair who used them to lure the foundation here. The kids are seemingly an outlier, though. Monica trauma triggers Utsugi intentionally and afterwards is informed of the transmission being sabotaged by Shingetsu. They all then reactivate a pure black bear named Kurokuma who also has the same voice actor as Shirakuma. The girls escape the tower but begin to argue and have difficulties when Fukawa says Komaru hasn't done anything for herself, something that's definitely not true. Komaru heads back to the resistance base and gets a new electricity type bullet named Paralyze along the way. Talking to Hayaji, they learn the kids have only killed adults so far that have children, and the base is suddenly attacked by Monokumas who trailed the girls back. Despite putting their lives at risk to help, Haiji screams them out and locks them up in the base, at which point Komaru is kidnapped by Utsugi, who wants to take her out personally. She's taken to a bullet train, and an awakening show breaks out of her cell, trailing Komaru with help from a few of the Monokuma kids. After saving Komaru from Utsugi, the two sort of make up and then face down her robot and defeat her, but stop the crowd of kids from dragging her off like the previous two bosses. In the middle of the arena, they're approached by Shingetsu, who agrees to let them go if they just leave the city and stop interfering with the creation of their paradise. And that brings us to the start of this chapter. Unfortunately for Shingetsu though, his desperation to please has now dearly cost him. A nearby Monokuma kid is filming the whole thing, making it known to an observing Komaida, who can easily relay this information elsewhere. This means that by the time the boy offers to lead the wary duo to a secret passageway out of town, he's on Monika's list of burned bridges, meaning the Monokumas are fully willing to attack him in the open, meaning more escort missions. Not necessarily fun from a gameplay perspective, but certainly an interesting narrative development at the very least. We've always seen Shingetsu acting as the most mature of the group, or at least the one trying to be. Here though, what becomes more increasingly clear is his seeming determination to succeed for the sake of other people's expectations. There's this almost frantic quality to how he acts in response to that that already plants very obvious seeds for what things we'll find out about him later, and it's honestly very well written. Speaking of which, it's at this time that because of Shingetsu spilling the beans, we get a bit more backstory on the Warriors of Hope themselves. Classmates in the Hope's Peak Elementary program, this group was always thought of as problem children, though gifted in their own respects. Rather poignantly here, Shingetsu remarks, But I resented being called a troublemaker. It makes it sound as if we ourselves were the cause of the trouble. But that's not right. Our troubles were created by adults, by our parents. And to an extent, it's easy to see where he's coming from. The society around us is by and large shaped by the adults who rise to the top. If the whole thing is inherently flawed from the top down, it's no wonder that the system would in turn be unable to help its most vulnerable. And there are few as vulnerable to the whims of society and the adults who rule it than children. In essence, the whole riot in Toa is nothing more than the most miserable of those children asserting a similar hold over society, but having none of the understanding or life experience necessary to know what they're getting themselves into or how to upkeep it. It's a pile upon of trauma, grief, and revenge. It spirals out of control and becomes the nightmare it is precisely because of the emotional immaturity and yet impossible to ignore pain and misery that these children, especially in a society that birthed the tragedy itself, have been forced to endure. In a place like this, is it any wonder that something like this would eventually come to pass? Not only that, we even get a bit of information about Shingetsu himself, what kind of pain he's endured to get him to this point. His parents treated him more like a test subject than a child, something to funnel statistics into like a video game character to level up, an extension of their own will rather than an individual with feelings and thoughts and needs. He was made to study from morning to night, given analeptics when he was sleepy during the process, and even forcibly made to endure with an IV in his arm for days straight when he became so exhausted that he literally passed out. They did all of this both while he was at home and at school, and his father was even a teacher there. We already knew Hope's Peak had a dubiousness when it came to their scientific side. What happened to one Hajime Hinata was more than enough proof of that. But steadily, it's becoming even clearer what a monstrous institution they really were capable of being, which makes Junko's revolt starting around their misdeeds even more believable. And according to Shingetsu, he's well off compared to some of the others. Even claiming Monika's status of being wheelchair-bound is purely due to the jealousy of her father and brother who did it to her deliberately. And yeah, it's easy to see how a kid like Shingetsu's view on all of this would be shaped by the immense amount of of traumatic experience he's had to endure in such a short life so far. Because we had talent. Because we were superior. We were treated like we were in hell, he says. But during it all, we didn't hold a grudge against our parents. We accepted how we were treated. Because we weren't aware that it was okay to hate our parents. We trusted the common knowledge that kids must love their parents, so we didn't fight it. Instead, we bonded over our struggle. And those discussions led us to the same conclusion. 
we had to escape from the horrifying world that made us suffer. But who pulled them back from that brink? Why, the master of manipulating the vulnerable, of course. The perfectly devious logician whose number one talent is weaponizing the discontent, apathy, and pain that lies at the center of people's hearts when they reach their breaking point. Junko and Oshima saved these children's lives, but not for the sake of altruism, of course. Reasoning that if they didn't want their lives anymore, they should give them to her, she promised to make them capable of fighting, and abducted the warriors. It didn't even make much news, because the incident was beginning to spiral out of control by that time, and was swept into the swath of other surrounding noise. And like the master manipulator she is, she not only showered them with affection to gain their trust, but drilled a purpose into them for her own selfish gain. The idea of a children's paradise free from adult influence was all her idea, and now the children are building upon what their architect left behind. It was as if we saw the light. Thanks to her, we finally realized. The common knowledge we had known up until then were lies adults created for their own benefit. Children cannot defy their parents. Everyone must get along. Violence can never bring peace. To destroy the world based on such lies, we decided to fight against the adults. As far as I remember, the first adult we defeated was a random person we didn't even know. We learned that kids can kill adults if they wanted to, and we were encouraged. From there, we leveled ourselves up by killing demons. Though Fukawa likens their thinking and the way Junko took advantage of them to a cult, it's already too late for that to matter. These were kids who were so desperate, so beaten down, and so frightened that they forced themselves to become capable of this kind of naked brutality. And now they're so desensitized to it that it's all they know how to do to protect themselves. It's horrible, but just like every other brand of manipulation that Junko Enoshima has been personally involved in, it's horrifically easy to see how it happened. Shingetsu even claims they know that Junko was taking advantage of them, but would simply prefer to be taken advantage of by someone who gave off the illusion of loving them and sharing a common goal with them than an adult who would simply demand their respect while showing them none in return. Say what you like. Big Sis Junko gave us hope. That's the truth. And there it is again, another person's despair being another person's hope. How could Junko and Oshima's actions bring anyone hope, right? We've been told over and over again how she is the embodiment of despair, craves in it all forms, plunged the entire world around her into it. But to these kids, she was their salvation. She even gave them the strength, Shingetsu says, to kill their own parents. After she was defeated, they lost their guide. They had nowhere else to go or any idea what to do without her. Which is why, when Monica proclaimed that they had to hold on to the hope that she gave them, slid right into the role of manipulator that she'd been trained by her big sister for, they couldn't help but get right back to work on what they'd been taught to strive for. And now, here we are. First off, pure evil simply does not exist. In all evil, there is something good. And in the same way, justice always hurts someone. There is no pure justice either. But even if that's true, a dream that requires you to hurt someone, I think it's wrong. But Shingetsu's desperation to see this go off without a hitch tempted him to take shortcuts, to try to get us out of the picture so there would be one less problem to worry about. But it's all in the name of efficiency, and we've seen how contradictory Monica's priorities have been when it comes to building their paradise and playing her games. Cross the mage and you'll be cursed. That, unfortunately, seems to be the name of the game now. And upon taking us to a shrine where the exit is hidden, this becomes unfortunately very clear. Komaida is here to tell us that we should rightly be having second thoughts about leaving at this stage, and even admits that Komaru's whole journey so far has been one of his own design. He's the one who tampered with our gun at the beginning, after all. He's the one who fed us breadcrumbs to follow the trails he wanted us to find. And he's even the one who instructed certain Monokuma kids to bring us upgrades and new ammo types. All of this has been Komaida's contribution to what he calls game balance, wanting to see whether our hope is strong enough to beat the children's despair. Especially since Komaru is the otherwise plain-seeming sister of the hope that beat Junko herself, claiming that he himself has become part of the despair because if hope is destined to win, it doesn't matter which side he plays for, as long as he ensures from within that both sides are equipped to fight as best they can. It's definitely crazy talk, but it's very consistent with what Komaida has always been like, so it's very interesting to get a peek of him here at this stage of his life. Furthermore, he even admits flat out that the game is more important to Monika than the Paradise, which he claims Shingetsu must have known whether he wants to believe it or not, because otherwise he wouldn't be sneaking around like he is, and this does not make him happy. The biggest bomb drop, though, comes in the form of Komaida explaining that Fukawa's presence here with us has always been part of the game. She was to lead Komaru to this point and exchange her as a hostage to take back Togami. It's the reason why she was conveniently on the building Komaru landed on after first leaving the ship. Komaida briefed Fukawa on all of this. However, as much as it comes off as a huge shock and betrayal to Komaru, it's also easy to see that Fukawa no longer feels good about this. 
Before she'd gotten to know Komaru, she was operating on the same principles and antisocial standards we've always known Fukawa for. It tracks. But in getting to know Komaru, help her, care about her, and even go through ups and downs over the course of this journey with her, Fukawa's mind has changed. The her of yesterday would have traded Komaru's life for Togami's without a second thought, but she no longer feels that way, even if she claims to still. And it's easy to see that her friendship with the other girl has brought her a sort of peace and even confidence she hasn't ever felt. One she no longer feels is so easily worth throwing away. All my life, nobody even tried to trust me. It's always been like that. That's why I've never had a problem lying to people. But regardless, why do you still believe in someone like me? Trying to force herself to get it all over with, Fukawa uses the stun gun to bring out Sho, leading to a brief boss encounter with her. While thematically I love this bit of the story, I gotta take a second to say, this boss sucks. It makes it even clearer the kind of disparity in movement that exists between the two playstyles, because you honestly have to play chicken with Sho for this entire fight to even stand a chance of surviving it, while taking the most measly, infrequent pot shots you can manage in between to chip away at her health. All while every time she hits you, they use it as another obnoxious excuse for clothing ripping fan service too. It's like, come on. I know I probably shouldn't be saying this, but could this just not have been part of the cutscene? It's also just a little confusing, to be honest, because the hacking gun, as explained to us at the beginning, is primarily composed of electromagnetic waves or something, which is why it's a weapon built to attack robots, the monokumas in the city, turning it into a survival horror weapon that isn't built to have an actual human body count, but somehow it's able to actually attack show with, who is, you know, a human person? Maybe I missed something here, but that doesn't seem like it tracks. Anyway, upon defeating her, one of my favorite, if not my absolute favorite sequence of this game plays out. Komaru demands to know if Fukawa was intentionally provoking her by insisting that she was an idiot who fell for her lies because she wanted Komaru to beat her and then feel no regrets about leaving her behind. And Fukawa can't lie, she agrees that was her intention upon getting to this point. She also claims that she's sickened by Komaida and has no desire to take orders from him, saying that hearing him talk about hope makes it sound disgusting, which pretty much echoes exactly what I said about Komaida's brand of hope back in the beginning of the SDR2 video. Not content to simply let this slide though, he tries to bring Sho out for an attack one more time by forcing Fukawa to sneeze. But when Sho emerges, she cuts down Komaida instead, leaving him on the ground with cuts to his knees, explaining that though she doesn't share memories with Fukawa, she does share emotions. Even our favorite slash-happy serial killer has no desire anymore to do anything but kill Komaida and let Komaru escape. Instead of letting Sho go through with it though, Komaru stops her, claiming that they're just as much friends and that she knows Sho has been working hard not to kill so that Fukawa could gain the Foundation's trust and become a full member, not content to let her backslide and ruin all of her own hard work just for Komaru's sake. I realize that not considering the emotional context of this series and the character, this all sounds a bit comedically messed up, but trust me, it is actually pretty sweet. My only gripe with this scene, which is admittedly improved in the English dialogue a bit, is that Komaru still doesn't seem to be fully able to distinguish Sho and Fukawa from each other in terms of personal identity, and I feel like that weakens this bit just a little because, again, it seems a little like something she should have figured out about her friend at this point. But this is where I'll give props to the localization for making it a bit clearer of a delineation, and more like Komaru acknowledges them as a pair, rather than conflating their identities. Though Sho briefly argues that Komaru should just leave because she's scared and shouldn't worry about someone who betrayed her, Komaru disagrees. She says she knows Sho and Fukawa are scared too, that they don't want to be here, but helped Komaru anyway, and furthermore that they feel bad about ever having considered betraying her in the first place, which is why she has no intention to run away anymore. She won't cower, but neither will she endanger the hostage. She's going to stay by her friend's side and fight this tragedy to the bitter end with her, because that's what friends do. Playing it off for the most part because she clearly hasn't ever had someone assert being her friend before, Sho turns away, and for a brief moment, one of the genuinely sweetest to ever come from this franchise, drops her theatricisms and cackling madwoman routine to deliver a single, simple word in response. Thanks. As she sneezes and brings Fukawa back, the two girls have officially solidified their commitment to one another and demand info from the injured Komaida. He concedes the location of the final boss area, one we'll have to prepare for before reaching, and as they walk away, he's faced by an angered Shingetsu wielding his boss robot, as Komaida laments that he really is a child. 
Man, this sequence was good. It had its problems, of course, but the quality on display here really makes you almost stunned that this comes from the same game as the entire last chapter did. Not only was the stuff about Shingetsu and the kids really thought-provoking and sad, but man, Fukawa's character arc across this game has been nothing if not wonderful to see. Let me be clear, I'm not the kind of person that felt like Fukawa's character needed to be redeemed in my eyes to like her. I already thought Fukawa was one of the most fun characters in the original game, regardless of whether she could be considered one of the objectively best people in the group. Her particular brand of humor and her incredible portrayal by Miyuki Sawashiro is a blast. That being said, the way her imperfections are not only not glossed over in this game, but actively shown in the context of someone trying to be better and still often falling into their common mistakes, but showing the determination to grow from their experiences and make meaningful connections in the process, that's really good stuff. And again, it's only made more poignant and interesting to follow because Fukawa's been given the opportunity to be a returning character from a previous entry, who benefits from undergoing more of a long-form character arc across both games instead of just the one. No joke, I think despite her obvious flaws and the obvious flaws associated with her writing, particularly the depiction of mental illness associated with her, Toko Fukawa is one of the most well-written characters in the entire Danganronpa franchise, precisely because of her growth across both of the entries she features primarily in. It's heartwarming to watch her go from point A to B to C, and if Chapter 3 showed off everything there is to loathe about Ultra Despair Girls, I think Chapter 4 just as confusingly has already managed to show off precisely what there is to love about it too, with just this sequence alone. Of course, there's still plenty more of Chapter 4 left to go though, so let's get a move on, shall we? Of course we need to have another really esoteric and difficult to understand puzzle to bookmark an otherwise great section of the story, right? Yeah, usually I like the more creative puzzles in UDG, but this one is just a bit too big and complicated for my liking, and I don't feel ashamed for saying I screwed it up a few times before realizing the solution and, uh, not being impressed. Along the way, you're given the burn ammo in conjunction with an encounter with the new enemy type, the Destroy Monokumas. Burn is basically a rapid fire, er, fire type ammo, which shoots out in a big stream like a Galaga gun, and how fitting is that considering that it's practically only useful against a type of enemy that flies around on jetpacks shooting at you? Burn is useful for almost nothing else in reality, because it's just a less effective form of break that is slower to killing enemies except for this kind, and just happens to come in much larger ammo bundles to compensate for how many of them you'll be firing at one time when using it. It doesn't really have any other practical or creative uses related to fire or anything like that either, so it just comes across as something meant to fill one of the wheel slots and not much else. It's pretty underwhelming really, and I think that's a shame because I could think of several creative design instances in which a firepower could be used for creative puzzle solving or combat encounters, but nope, it's just another thing to whip out at extremely specific points to kill an extremely specific type of enemy, and that's it. Well, at least we find another interesting bit of Toa lore while lurking around, something questioning whether a war between Toa City and the Despairs lurks in the future, because apparently with everything Toa has done to try to remedy the incident, it seems inevitable. Though it also questions why the Despairs haven't moved to attack Toa before this point, and, well, even now, seeing what's happening, it's hard to reconcile this information. We know the kids are carrying on the will of Junko, but as far as we can tell, the only thing we know the remnants of Despair to have a direct hand in was luring the Future Foundation here, and Komaida being the servant of the warriors, albeit with his own agenda. If they haven't been super involved though, what's going on and why haven't they been? Furthermore, the duo are starting to wonder more about the inconsistent behavior of the Monokuma kids. Fukawa even brings up that she no longer doubts the ringleaders all had terrible childhoods, but that she can't imagine a reason all of these children would suddenly be motivated to commit mass murder. Things to wonder about as we try to navigate this labyrinthine part of the hub world for sure. After a particularly frustrating batch of puzzles, we make our way back to the tunnels, presumably to find the sewers again. Rather cutely at this point, Komaru tries to ease Fukawa into her first friendship by taking the step to give her a nickname, which is Toki. Chan. That's honestly pretty forward, and given Fukawa's over-the-top inability to handle it, it's a pretty funny and cute scene to break up a lot of the drama we've been going through lately. Well, it's at least a temporary distraction from the harder-hitting topics we're going to have to get back into, namely because we find an adult NPC directly afterward who, in a crazed manic state, happily declares that she's finally gathered the courage to fight back by murdering one of the kids. We've seen plenty of the adults talk about fighting back for a while and dehumanize the kids to that end to psych themselves up for it. But until this point, we haven't actually heard of one of them legitimately going that far. And despite all the kids have done, it's hard to see this as a good thing in any context. Is that really the direction we should be going? 
Kamaru and Fukawa can't seem to stomach it either, deciding it's best to just leave her alone. Of course, they also debate whether she's actually in her right mind and if she isn't just daydreaming the whole thing, but regardless of whether it actually happened or not, the thought that she's so joyful over the idea either way definitely gives one something to chew on as a result. Anyway, ready for a fun new game mechanic? Yeah, this game practically invented the term mood whiplash, it feels like sometimes. Anyway, here's where we get our final type of ammo called Link. It allows us to, what else, link to the Monokumas and control them by shooting it at them. Of course, it only allows us to control one at a time, and we're vulnerable while controlling them, so we have to be careful to be out of harm's way while doing so, but it's definitely an interesting ability to play with, particularly for puzzle purposes. I think it's probably good that it didn't get wheeled out until the second to last chapter, though, because it would have seemed a bit overpowered to throw into the gambit earlier. But its inclusion here definitely spices things up, and it's hard to debate that perhaps the game couldn't have used a little more of this sort of thinking a bit earlier on. Of course, I won't claim Link isn't without its flaws, because controlling the Monokumas can be a bit clumsy, and it has its limitations, so you may fumble at times while trying to find the sweet spot of what you're meant to do with it. While roaming through the rubble of the subway, in fact, there are a few puzzles utilizing it, and while some are pretty decent, this destroy the floor with an explosion one is so obtuse. The solution made me feel like an idiot for not getting it sooner, but also the precision combined with the game's usual technical sloppiness also made me feel like this was at least partially the game's fault for not making this clearer, or at the very least providing any kind of puzzle before this point that required you to do something similar so I'd even have the slightest idea what it wanted from me. Using the exploded train tracks as a makeshift ladder, the duo descend to the sewers and find the resistance again, and we cut back to Shingetsu taking his frustrations out on Komaida. No matter how much he wants to blame the inconsistencies on what's going on on Komaida himself, though, it's not going to help him turn away anymore. Monica admits flat out to sending Komaida out on his tasks, and even tells Shingetsu she has no intention of creating a children's paradise. This was all a trick that he and the others fell for, a distraction from Monica's real, undisclosed motives. She even tries to play into his childish crush on her by stealing a kiss from him, doubtlessly both a way to provoke his undying loyalty but also break him under pressure even more. Trotting out the manipulative tendencies she cultivated from her idol, Monica reminds Shingetsu that he suffers the most from trying to fulfill the expectations of others, and even his own expectations, that he self-imposes because of that fear. But that she's never expected anything of him from the start, which is why she felt no qualms about lying and keeping secrets from him about her plans for the successor. She even tries to gaslight him about whether what he thought was going on in his upbringing was ever actually happening or not the thing most capable of shattering his worldview were it true. And with Shingetsu this thoroughly broken down, he's at his most moldable. Yeah, she really did learn well from her big sis after all, didn't she? As the girls return to the Resistance base, they find the adults being attacked yet again by the Monokumas, but once again offer their protection in another painful-to-play escort mission. Afterwards, we're approached by a desperate Shirakuma, who claims the Monokumas are getting in through a hole at the back of the base, and that he can only think of one way to prevent them from getting in and killing more people, by going there and allowing Komaru to shoot him so he explodes and causes rubble to block the hole. Of course, Komaru doesn't want to do that, and there's a good chance the player doesn't either. As suspicious as Shirakuma rightfully is, he's still never done anything to make us doubt his goodwill, and he's always been nothing but helpful and kind. Komaru can't bring herself to do it, and in a moment that genuinely tugs at my heartstrings, Shirakuma tries to convince her by undoing his bandages so Komaru has no choice but to see the glaring red eye of the Monokuma underneath, even attacking her to try to force her to do it. The first time I played this, I'll be honest, I kept avoiding his attacks because I wasn't even sure if this was the right thing to do. I thought maybe if I held out long enough, I wouldn't have to, but nope, no such luck. After bringing yourself to finally shoot him enough times, Shirakuma goes up in a spark of electricity, thanking Komaru and shedding tears as he explodes, accomplishing exactly what he meant to in the process. Heartbroken by his sacrifice, but also spurred on by it, Komaru climbs atop the van in the base and gives everyone a rousing speech. That they have to fight, no matter how scared they are. That they can't be content to remain victims, cowering away and ignoring everything that's happening around them. That they can't just hide in fear forever, because if they do, they run the risk of losing something important. Pleading that she, like everyone else here, wants a cheesy, happy ending. She begs their help to make that ending a reality, and it speaks to everyone there, even Hayaji, who claims that he has one last bet to consider before giving up. Of course, some of the tension is cut a little short when we realize that Shirakuma's sacrifice miraculously didn't kill him, rather leaving him as a head with his AI intact, but it's at least a sign of how much Komaru has grown, right? In fact, something I find really cool about this bit is that in solidifying that she really has made a change in attitude from the version of herself we all met at the beginning of the game, her idle animation, walk, and run cycle have all changed. 
Her body language was previously more withdrawn, uncertain, and scared-seeming, but now Komaru stands upright, confident, and poised, and her strides are less reluctant and pulled inward, but more broad-shouldered, outgoing, and proud. It's a small touch, but it's a very deliberate one that the team must have put quite a bit of attention into, especially considering it happens very specifically at this point of the story and not a moment sooner. It's really cool stuff, and another example of masterfully subtle character work that just goes to show that UDG is not incapable of making insightful and well-developed writing decisions when it isn't screwing around, which makes me wish all the more that they'd not screwed around earlier. Speaking of screwing around, UDG immediately squanders a bit of my goodwill right after this because it can't help itself, claiming that he has something that could change the tide of the conflict but that he's been too afraid until now to try retrieving, Haiji takes us on a motorcycle to a hidden location, which he's trusting Komaru to lead the assault on. Apropos of basically nothing at all, Kodaka decides now would be the perfect time for Fukawa to make a joke about him wanting them alone for dirty stuff, and he responds that, ew, he wouldn't get with people their age, because he actually likes girls as young as possible. Die a violent death. Uh, gross? What? And let me be clear, Haiji sucks and the game knows this, but it doesn't seem like the game knows Haiji sucks for this reason. Because not only is this a throwaway line, which only comes up one other time in this chapter, but both times it's brought up as a joke that we're supposed to somehow find funny, despite the fact that he's not kidding. And the second time around, they even have Komaru comment that, well, it's kind of attractive that he's honest about it, actually. Are you out of your mind? No, it is clearly not. And Komaru, honey, I'm so sorry that the skeevy dip who wrote this script really made you say something like that because, oh my God, what were you thinking with this nonsense, Kodaka? You literally can't let me compliment your writing for more than two unbroken sequences before showing your entire ass yet again, can you? I'm so tired of this. Uh, this <clears throat> joke did not need to be here. And yet again, I must dock points that UDG should have easily been able to refrain from having docked because it needs to keep reminding me of why so many people reasonably hate it so bad. God. Anyway... This section is actually an old factory of the Toa groups, which Haiji claims houses the secret weapon in its basement. And I'll be honest, the roaming part of this area is horrible. It's constantly fixated around these large open rooms where you need to sneak around and avoid these security lasers, because if you don't, a big siren Monokuma sets the alarm off and you get swarmed by enemies. This thing has a huge reach, moves really quickly, and sets off if it even touches so much as a pixel of Komaru's model, which as you might imagine is really irritating and doesn't make sneaking around this place feel even remotely fun, especially considering there's not a lot of places to run to cover for, so getting caught immediately after turning the alarm off is ridiculously easy. Well, at the very least, the puzzle rooms in this place are all pretty decent, some even being really creative and fun, and we get a bit more lore to chew on. The Monokumas here are actually guard robots that were built by the Toa group itself, and while Haiji claims that they only became aberrant recently and that he has very little idea about what was going on outside of that, it's easy to become more than a little suspicious of the guy by this point. Even though Fukawa being suspicious isn't really unusual for her by this point, I can't say I disagree with her for it at all. Haiji even keeps insisting that they go and find the adult's hope, and with everything we've heard so far about what constitutes one person's hope, she says she'll be the judge of that hope, whatever it is. And that's, again, honestly pretty compelling. After a frankly tiring amount of laser-filled rooms, which are at the very least somewhat cushioned by the wealth of honestly pretty fun puzzle rooms, we reach the final room, where we need to sneak into the management office to disable a grid of lasers preventing us from accessing the final elevator. Searching the room for clues to the computer password, it ends up being related to the birthday picture on the desk in the Zodiac chart on the wall, which is, uh, well, it's okay, but I've seen better. And finally, the lasers are disabled. Below, we find the assembly line and even a memoir of Shingetsu's, which is rather revealing. It proves that even after everything he said, even after killing his parents, he secretly holds regrets for having done so, and an inherent respect and love toward them that he can't shake. But the thing driving him forward is determination to build the paradise, and especially because he feels the need to save Monica from her situation, even calling her more precious than his own life. This rings especially depressing considering what we now know to be true and how Monica has treated him, and it's definitely something to consider going forward as we come closer and closer to confronting Monica herself, who we know by this point has to be the final boss. Finally reaching the door which houses the adult's supposed trump card, Haiji reveals to us a giant Monokuma robot called the Big Bang Monokuma, which he claims was originally made for the sake of protecting the city, and something only he and his father are capable of piloting. 
Claiming he can use this to fight back, clearly wanting to be some big hero, it's clear now, if it wasn't already, what kind of person Haiji is. Of course, the duo want more of an explanation as to why the Toa group was building them in the first place, and he finally relents that they were building them as maid robots to assist with daily life and dangerous labor. He claims that the kids taking over is what changed all this and that the design wasn't chosen by him, that he wasn't even aware of its significance at the time. Before he can tell us who was responsible for designing them, though, they're set upon by the mind-broken Shingetsu and his boss robot. Baffled, Haiji asks Shingetsu if she told him about this, wanting him to destroy it if she couldn't control it. Which definitely gives us some hints about what we were just wondering. Shingetsu can't respond, though. All he can do is cave to his trauma response, beg and plead to be expected something from, and not to be abandoned by everyone in his life. It's honestly really heartbreaking, and I'd say of all the kids in the group, Shingetsu's arc is the most well-handled of the bunch in terms of actual depth of character and actual handling. Engaging us in yet another robot fight, Shingetsu gives us the first fight so far that isn't in the typical Colosseum format. Honestly, I'm a bit mixed on it. I think the different environment and this robot sniping gimmick gives it a lot more of an individual opportunity to shine and stand out when compared to the somewhat formulaic feeling of the last few bosses, however, it still suffers from similar problems regarding the camera system and Kamaru's overall movement speed. It's really easy to just get blindsided by pot shots you aren't really equipped to dodge very effectively, and this can definitely make the fight more frustrating than engaging, when it should honestly be the most mechanically engaging fight yet. Still, it does succeed at holding my attention a bit more and providing a bit more intrigue to the actual format so far, comparatively, so I have to at least give it props for that. After a bit of taking cover and firing well-timed shots, the robot explodes, falling and seemingly taking Shingetsu with it, though we again don't actually get confirmation of that. This time, it's time for Komaru to be the one worrying about his safety, and Haiji takes on the role she did in Chapter 2, of basically saying he had it coming to him and coldly leaving him behind. The familiarity of this sentiment at a time like this both goes to show how much Komaru has grown yet again, but also further pushes the theme that I've been talking about for a while now, while basically making Haiji the final spokesperson of the kill all the kids side of this argument. He even wants us to use the Big Bang Monokuma to do just that after all. But at this crucial juncture, what should we even do? Now that we're here, what's the right choice? Should we really let Haiji of all people decide that his hope is what's best for everyone? Cutting away one last time to Monica in what appears to be a torture dungeon, she opens a door to ask for the help of an unseen mom and dad in beginning the final preparations for their daughter to become the successor to Junko and Oshima, ending chapter 4. This chapter is a lot more complicated to discuss in terms of my actual feelings, if you didn't already figure as much. There's a lot to like about it, between the overall thematic strength, the wonderful development of both Fukawa and her relationship with Komaru, Shingetsu's hauntingly effective character arc along with Monika's increasingly vile imitations of her idol, Shirakuma's sacrifice and Komaru's monologue, her individual growth as a character, and the frankly cool-as-hell way they factor that visually into the game, and to top it all off, I'd even say it has the highest density of fun puzzles to be found in a chapter of this game so far. On the other hand, you also have things like the completely useless new ammo type, the completely useless new enemy type, the entire beginning puzzle section, the escort missions, the laser rooms, and god, I really can't stress how repulsive the bit with Haiji is, even as quickly as it goes by. Like, yeah, I can turn away and try to ignore it, but it really is just so bad that it leaves a bad taste in my mouth for the rest of the chapter, and it's a little difficult to be hyped up about the chapter's strengths once it happens. This one is contentious. It's certainly nowhere near the dumpster fire chapter 3 was, but considering this one little bit is so bad on its own, it unfortunately does a lot of quick work to bury its better aspects as a result, and that's a pretty big shame. I think not considering those couple of horrible lines, this is actually probably one of the best chapters in the game. But like all things UDG related, it can't get by unscathed by error, and as much as I have to praise about it, it's not as if I can let it get by scot-free either. The increase in effort was appreciated, but you have to do a little better than that. And you only have one chapter left to do so, so you better hop to it. So, Big Bang Monokuma is I'm on a rampage. I got problems with my feet and my bed. I'm on a rampage. I'm about to have a dope rhyme attack. I'm on a rampage. Don't see rock all type of sport. I'm on a rampage. The adults are cheering and the kids are fleeing. Komaida is on his way out, but informs Monica of an intruder into the city, to which she wonders if the foundation is on the move. 
Though Komaida asks if her plan is coming to ruin, she says that everything is going exactly to plan, which is definitely interesting. Haiji is rallying the adults up to take on the kids in his trademark concerning manner, and Shirakuma has noticed too, pleading with Komaru to find a way to resolve this without leading to the deaths of the adults or the kids. Accepting our task, we head off to Toa Hills to confront the only person we know who can bring an end to the situation. As we do, of course, the adults are riling themselves up to fight the kids, solidifying their hopes that they were inspired by Komaru initially to build, but encouraged further by Haiji to turn into this violent hatred. It just goes to further hammer in the ambiguity of what these platitudes really amount to in Danganronpa proper by this point. Inside the building, we're faced with a final gauntlet with a somewhat formulaic setup. We arrive on one floor's lobby, which usually contains some letters or documents to find and enemies to fight. Each floor has a set of stairs leading up to the next, which is beyond a large door. However, each door is blocked by two of the boss robots we've encountered so far. To move said robots, we need to tackle the two puzzle room doors on either side of the lobby, which upon victory in said puzzle rooms will grant us access to the respective bedroom of the robot's corresponding Warrior of Hope. Inside, not only do we get to see items and aesthetics of note that are relevant to each kid, but also the controller for their robot, which we can use to move it aside, and in the process find a letter written from the perspective of the parent who traumatized them most, giving us a bit more insight into what they were dealing with. Kemery's parent was someone who very clearly had no desire for a child and yearned for him to disappear or die so they could stop looking after him, refusing to accept responsibility for having had him in the first place. Utsugi's mother was deluded into thinking that her daughter should be grateful for what she was put through, because it was a matter of cost-effectiveness and shining a spotlight on her, a truly reprehensible way of treating your own child. Daimon's father is, of course, a typical angry drunk with a temper and violent streak who views his son as worthless and even hates him for trying in vain to please his parent through all of his fear and pain, calling him a defective product. And of course, Shingetsu's father only treated him like a test subject, not even referring to him by name, only clinically detailing his results and claiming that if Shingetsu breaks down and doesn't provide desirable results, he'll consider it entirely the fault of his own child and move on to another subject. All the while going through these motions, the puzzle rooms are honestly some of the best in the game. They're not without their slightly irritating elements here and there, of course, but these are so creative and fun to figure out, especially the one where you have to use Link to solve an environmental puzzle instead of even engaging in a combat scenario at all. It's especially well thought out and fun to get your head wrapped around. I was honestly pleasantly surprised by the level of quality on display here. We also get a very revealing document as outlined by Monica in one of these rooms, revealing something we might have suspected about many of the kids in Monokuma helmets. Namely, that a lot of them are being mind-controlled. Yeah, not all of these kids obviously have a lust for blood and desire to kill adults. While I'm sure some willingly came over to the side of the Warriors of Hope, whether because of similar trauma, peer pressure, or coercion, some were still very likely to refuse outright and therefore had to be subjugated. That just gives us even more reasons not to want to let the adults go through with their all-out assault on the kids themselves, and makes it that much more eerie and sad to see tons of them sitting around in a depressive state now that the adults are rising up. It begins in that sense to seem less like bratty murderers getting their just desserts, and more like legitimately terrified children who have a very real reason to think that they're going to get killed by a swarm of people much older and stronger than them. It's pretty harrowing to consider. Upon reaching the top, though, we realize we're still blocked off by an elevator that needs a retinal scan from someone high up at the company, and not just anyone, as Haiji is quick to point out, but the Toa Group chairman, his father, who was already dead. His corpse is still here, though, as disgusting as it is to consider, but we do need it. Again, Haiji curses a mysterious her who he claims is probably responsible, and to add to just how despicable he's been this whole time, he even demands Komaru and Fukawa go get his dad's eyes for the scanner because he, a grown man, has no problem letting two teenage girls go in his stead to do something as blatantly traumatizing as yoinking a dead man's peepers. Class act, Taiji. Class act. The act of getting to the office is admittedly a bit less than easy, with a precarious few combat encounters directly preceding it. But eventually, we make our way into the chairman's office. It is an absolute train wreck of a scene, but despite how absolutely hollowed out, disgusted, and traumatized they are, the duo get what they need and bring it back in a paper bag. Upon doing so, Komaru is very surprised to see the old man's spirit has appeared, prompting her to drop said bag and very briefly get possessed by him, so he can basically just dump a little bit of background on himself. I feel like as weird as this series has been by now, I shouldn't feel my suspension of disbelief starting to wear thin, but to be honest, this does kind of take the cake for me of the stuff we've covered so far. 
Anyway, he reveals what we probably already suspected, that yes, the her Haiji is referring to is none other than Monica, whose full name we now know is Monica Toa, the daughter of Tokuichi Toa himself and little sister to Haiji. Boy, I wonder if he had anything to do with how she turned out. Anyway, Chairman Toa basically spends the rest of his possession time proving he's a jackass misogynist by admitting that not only was Monica's mother his mistress who he cheated on his wife with, but basically whinges that she could dare force him to take care of his own child. Even claiming that if his mistress weren't solely going to take care of Monica herself, you know, not expecting her millionaire boyfriend to chip in and take care of his child at all, that he wouldn't have even tolerated the pregnancy, period. He brags that he deigned to raise her instead of leaving her in an orphanage, and while sure, I guess he's got proper beef for being murdered, I gotta say, I don't actually feel too bad for him at all. He just blames all of his mistakes in raising Monica on the influence of Junko, not even bothering to consider why someone like Junko would appeal to Monica in the first place, because we know from experience that Junko Inoshima doesn't just tend to reach people who are already doing great in life. Anyway, thankfully, Fukawa uses the power of Christ compelling you to whisk Toa out of Komaru's body and put a stop to his r slash incel rant. Even though Komaru is a little disappointed she didn't get the chance to get more information that might could help, Fukawa is basically just convinced she went crazy for a second anyway, and we've already wasted enough time standing around listening to men from the Toa family whine about how they've got it so much worse than everybody else. Once we ride the elevator up, we're treated to an exploration segment, which I like to call the carpet maze, because it's long, dark, filled with a boring carpet, and while it's not particularly difficult to actually navigate, it does still act like a big gated labyrinth, and it's easily one of the worst parts of the chapter. Not the absolute worst, but it's really just dull and time-consuming. This is not at all helped by the fact that when we finally clear it, we get another puzzle room directly following a hall with a bunch of dentures scattered around it. Yep, it seems Utsugi is here, having intended to storm up and confront Monica before she was set upon by beast monokumas in one of the arcade rooms. We have to clear the room to disable them and save her, but unfortunately, this is the worst type of puzzle room. The singing kid in a capsule kind. God, I hate these. They take everything fun or interesting about these rooms and just don't do that. It's all the unfun, janky stealth crap that is easily the least interesting component of these rooms, and this one in particular is especially tiring. Of course, once we clear it and save her, she confirms our suspicions of changing sides, having overheard Monica's big betrayal of Shingetsu during Chapter 4. She speculates that Monica wants to be the successor herself, and reports that she's located, along with the key to Togami's cell, in the airship atop the roof called the Excalibur, which Kamaru was on during the prologue which means we have to return to where everything began. Along the way, we discover the torture dungeon, but not with any bodies laying around, just a mysteriously shaped bloodstain in the instruments we saw before. Haiji claims this is where the adults in the base saw their relatives' murders being broadcast to break them, part of why he claims he can't show any of the children mercy and has to kill them without hesitation. He even tries to briefly convince the girls to look at the bodies beyond one of the doors to solidify their own hatred, but they refuse. Finally arriving in the throne room, we discover a secret passage behind the wall that leads to a couple of things of note. First of all, up a ladder is Monica's room, which is pasted wall to wall with photos and memorabilia of Junko and Oshima, but crucially also features a photo of herself and Monica together. Inside also is a diary from Monica herself where she laments her abandonment from her mother. Selfishly do their business, selfishly give birth, and then to top it off, selfishly abandon. <laughs> Such pathetic characters. When I say a joke, the room freezes. When I smile, they make a face that says you don't deserve to laugh. They're so amazing. It's so splendid. So splendid that I want to die. Just kidding. No, seriously, I was kidding. Just a joke. But is she? I mean, from here on out, and even before this, we've seen and will see a lot of behavior that will call Monica's sincerity on any front into some serious question. But at the same time, the fact of her history is undeniable. What we heard her father say is revealing about how her parents treated her, and even the most bold lies can contain a hint of emotional truth. We also know that she, like the other warriors, fell susceptible to the trappings and rhetoric of Junko herself. And while she may have more cruelly embodied her idol's teachings than any of the others managed, that doesn't mean those teachings didn't appeal to her in some way relevant to how they've historically appealed to others in the past. Junko and Oshima praise upon those discontent with their society, discontent with their surroundings, and discontent even with their own life or existence. She wrings dry all of the wishes for a brighter tomorrow and replaces them with a cruel embittered lethargy that insists detachment and even a malevolent sense of humor to be yielded from the most sadistically horrible of things. Because it's what she posits is the nature of the world itself. 
There's no little girl in the world who'd fall for that without plenty of pain to pull from, regardless of how solidly unsympathetic she at any point manages to make herself from this time onward. There is more going on with Monica than we know, or may ever, and while I think the game underdelivers on this line of thinking, I don't think it's also meant to entirely be absent from what we're meant to take away from here. Through the other door, we find the spiral staircase up to the roof. A document about Makoto Naegi sits on the staircase, declaring that someone who could defeat Junko like himself needs to be killed. We were led to misfortune by Makoto Naegi, so we have no other choice. Pigs who kill for their own interest deserve to be killed by pigs for other people's interest. Atop the roof, we get one last enemy gauntlet fight, and it's both the hardest in the game and the most expressly irritating. I won't spend too much time describing it, rather I'll just be showing clips of it while I talk here, and I hope you'll start to be able to conceive in your own imagination, assuming you haven't played this bit of the game yourself before, how not fun this is to actually play. Are you imagining it? Yeah. It sucks. I wouldn't recommend it. Finally boarding the Excalibur, we're back where this all began, and we discover memoirs from all of the warriors. Monica's expresses a desperation to see Junko, who shined light on her world, and ending in a way that combined with how her diary we last found was written, is again, quite revealing. No matter how many painful things I do, no matter how many shameful things I do, it won't change the facts. Monica will just end up hurt and ashamed. I know that. Monica knows that. But because I know that, without a doubt, Monica feels lonely and sad and empty. I just want to die. And look, I know a lot of my audience probably hates this kid, and she's not going to do herself any favors coming up. But what kid says things like this, or even does the thing she does without going through some seriously horrible stuff? Kids don't act like this on their own. It's just not something that happens to a healthy child, and children are the most mentally vulnerable of all of us. Again, at the end of all this, UDG is posing us the same interesting questions about the responsibility children can truly hold for their actions, and whether we can even necessarily fully blame them for things they don't have the capacity to understand. Monica is the embodiment of this struggle made real by the narrative. What do you do with a child that not only does so much evil without fully grasping it, but also seems not to be able, or at least willing, to feel regret over it? We know the other warriors lean toward regret. Utsugi even said before that she's changed her mind about the whole thing, and Shingetsu's diary talks about desiring to protect Monica, but otherwise still feeling a painful affection towards his own parents. Despite their actions, it's easy to see their traumas and their regrets and easily come to the conclusion that they deserve to be treated kindly and given a chance to start over. But what about a child who doesn't regret anything they did? What do we as a society do with a child like that? Is there even a right answer to that question? I think at its best, UDG is trying to prompt us to think about it at the very least. It calls upon us, through good and bad, to be kinder to children, because if we don't ensure their lives start well, so, so many things can and will go wrong, and we will have brought it upon ourselves. I'll talk more about Monica in a bit, but we need to get through a little gauntlet of context before we can, so just bear with me. Arriving at the final room, we're told to find the door that belongs to Monica, and intuiting that her room was up a ladder, we find her pretty easily. That also brings to light something we probably should have suspected given the location of said rooms. Monica has been able to walk the entire time, and when Komaru asks why she lied about it, it actually ties directly into what's been so devious about the way her whole plan was structured in the first place. Because pitiful children are the most powerful, don't you think? She says. Monica's home life was terrible. She didn't feel like she belonged there, but Monica was more brilliant than her brother or her father, and they hated her for it. But then, I thought of a way I could counter their neglect and cruelty. All I had to do was become a pitiful figure. Then I would have the whole world's sympathy. When Monica talks, everyone freezes. When Monica smiles, everyone stops smiling. For Monica, the outsider, the eyesore, to survive in that house, she did what she had to do. Now granted, I think there is a decent argument to be made here that this twist is a little potentially hurtful. The trope of people faking a disability to garner sympathy implicitly frames people with disabilities as subjects of purely pity, and also perpetuates the myth of this sort of disability faking being much more nefariously common than it actually is, which gets a lot of actual disabled people hassled for really gross reasons. While I can't claim this is necessarily the actual intention of the writers, it's a trope I do find worth examining, or at least trying to be a bit more self-aware about. I myself am not disabled in any way similar to this, so I don't want to speak out of turn or over an audience that I can't fundamentally speak for. 
but I have seen some people take a bit of umbrage with this bit, and I can honestly see why. Still, I think it is, at its base, supposed to tie less into an inherent need for pity on Monica's behalf, but more broadly into her character goals, her philosophy, and also as an ultimate expression of her stance as it relates to the themes we've been discussing. So while I don't think this handling is beyond reproach, I do think it has an application solely beyond shock value, even if it doesn't necessarily stick the landing while trying to do so, but that's just my two cents. I encourage anyone with a bit more knowledge on all of this to chime in with their thoughts in the comments. Anyway, it's time for the final of the robot bosses, as Kurakuma jumps into the core and Monica takes her new seat upon a control throne. Meanwhile, the whole thing is broadcast to the city below. This boss is easily the most intricate so far, but it's also the worst so far in my opinion. You see, the way it works is that you have to shoot each and every one of these little glowing joints to make Kurakuma pop out, whereupon you shoot him. The big problem with this boss is a combination of factors. For one, the joints are so minuscule that they're really difficult to actually aim at, not just because of the typically slow camera movement that I've always complained about in bosses until now, but also because they just don't really seem to want to actually be hit unless your aim is extremely precise, which I don't think I need to tell you is pretty BS. Furthermore, Monica's attacks are sweeping, fast, and brutal. In particular, the one where she drops these diamond mines all over the arena that explode when you touch them is the worst, because you'll constantly be needing to run around and find the best split second to aim, while almost entirely unaware of where these things are because of the camera. It's not fun. Top it all off with Kurakuma chattering incessantly during the whole thing, repeating the same annoying phrases over and over again, and you've got yourself a formula for a really frustrating encounter, one that lasts way too long, and is something I'm more than happy to get out of the way for the much more interesting stuff that follows. Once you finally defeat the thing, it predictably explodes, sending Kurakuma's severed head out of the window. Huh. Strange. Kinda like what happened to Shirakuma, isn't it? I'm sure that won't become relevant somehow. As the adults cheer on Komaru's victory, Monica laments her defeat in such a typical fashion that you'd definitely be forgiven for realizing she's not letting on her whole plan yet. She has a literal controller in her hands that controls all of the Monokumas and begs very obviously for you to not take it and ruin her plans, which anyone in this situation would probably want to do right away. With everything we've learned about her so far, we need to dig deeper, so we can't break the controller yet, even when we're given the option to. It's a good thing we don't either, because Utsugi's arrived, and not only is she not happy with Monica, but she tells us exactly what's going to happen if we break the controller later in this conversation, casting the whole thing in progress into a stark light. You see, it doesn't just control the Monokumas, but also the control helmets of the Monokuma kids, and upon being broken, those helmets will all explode, killing the kids en masse. Monica was blatantly trying to bait us into doing so, but why is that? She correctly points out that to back down now is odd, because we've become the hero of the adults. We're the ones they crave to put an end to this, and it's hard to imagine that even at this point any of them would back down, even if it meant wiping out the children. To them, it would seem justified based on everything that's happened to them so far, and Monica knows that, hangs it over our heads to see what kind of person we really are. What reason has she ever had to anticipate that adults wouldn't be like that? Her expectation is one that hauntingly tracks. She taunts Komaru, asking if she didn't want to be everyone's hope like her brother once was, claiming that if this isn't ended, the tragedy will simply repeat over and over again. It's at this time that Haiji appears, and oh boy, as if this room wasn't already starting to feel complicated. His attitude has been made up for a while, and now he's gotten so crazed that he's screaming at Monica with literal swirls in his eyes, calling her his father's mistake and saying he never thought of her as family at all. And gee, I wonder where Monica got her attitude from, huh? Again, he even refuses to see her as a child at all, only content to demonize her and say she never knew her place. As we continue to refuse to break the controller, Haiji becomes even further enraged, asking if we're siding with the kids just because we don't want to kill them all. Which, man, if the point hasn't become revealing enough by now, I don't know what to tell you. The pressure is mounting, everyone is counting on Komaru to destroy the controller without mercy as they chant outside, and Haiji's pathetic whimpering only makes it even clearer, how thoroughly this game has gone to the lengths to make us think about the conflation of hope and despair as concepts to people by begging that Komaru can't hesitate because she showed the adults hope with her speech, giving them the confidence to fight back. But is this really how they should fight back? This is why the kids could confidently say somebody like Junko gave them hope, because the two concepts are practically inseparable, not even two sides of a coin, but more like inherently tied sensations, a constant of the world that proves that even when someone has something to gain, something to celebrate and to cherish, it often leaves someone else without or to get hurt. Do we really want to be that kind of hope? 
At that point, Haiji even begins to yank Monica's hair around, ordering her to confess everything she's ever done solely so she can receive the judgment of a stranger. In the process, Monica tells all that she never intended to die along with the warriors, but that her meeting with Junko was miraculous, because Junko was the first person she ever felt understood by. She fully acknowledges that Junko took advantage of her, getting in on her good side and telling her what she wanted to hear because Monica was at that time already the chief executive of Toa Group's robotics branch. A gifted child would be perfect to convince into making the Monokumas, right? And now we know both where their design came into play and why the Toa Group was making them. She even outright claims that the other warriors were just bonuses for Junko's manipulation and that in the end, Monica was really all she cared about getting her hands on. When Utsugi protests that Junko loved them all, she fires back. There's no way someone would love you. Your own parents didn't even love you. So of course, the Toa group mass-produced Junko's Monokumas for the sake of the tragedy. And even though Monika gives Haiji a chance to run with his previous excuse that she lied to them and told them that they were for household assistance, he admits that they more or less turned a blind eye to the truth, because as long as Monika was using her gift to make the Toa group money, she could do whatever she wanted if she'd otherwise kept quiet and stayed out of their way. Oh, who would have guessed the disaffected, selfish rich men who stood at the top of a giant billionaire tech corporation would willingly allow the apocalypse to play out if it was making them more money? Wow! Of course, once they started being used for their intended purpose and her father tried to put a stop to it, Monica only correctly pointed out that if he did, Junko would reveal the Toa group's ties to the incident, leaving them in ruin. And so, Big Bang Monokuma also came about, as Monica not only made the Monokumas, but sold the weapons to fight them too. Toa Group continued to become more and more profitable, and the deeper in they were, the less they cared about others and more about their own reputation. While deciding coldly to coexist with despair and fund its purposes, they stood in the background idly pretending to do all they could to fight its spread, becoming heroes to the world while having been majorly responsible for enabling the incident that started killing them all in the first place. Man, do you get the feeling three games deep that Danganronpa enjoys making social commentary? The only reason their city and their air purifier was even as effective as it was is because they were part of the cause. The incident didn't hit them as hard because they were playing both sides, like greedy cowards. And so the Toa group leaned in hard and became Junko Enoshima's patron in the end. The reason Haiji was so combative towards the Future Foundation is because he didn't want them to find out and claims no matter how rotten Toa's legacy is, it's his, so he wants to protect it, embodying everything wrong with their cyclical, self-serving pride, and inexhaustible lust for money and power. And let me take a second aside from the plot to say, this is really at the heart of what makes Monica such an interesting character to me. Even if I wish she had been developed upon more, in line with the theming she's obviously meant to herald. And it's why I think so much of the uncritical hatred towards her is troubling, to say the least. I'm not asking people to like what she's done, or even necessarily like her, but to think about her dislikable traits and imagine, just for a second, where did she learn these things? Who was there to protect her? Who was there to teach her better? I'm sure I don't need to tell you a second time that kids don't just turn up this way. An unfixably evil child is a myth. They don't exist. They're convenient scapegoats for people who know better. We know what kind of person Haiji is. We know what kind of person her father is. Who was there to show her any other way? I mean, nobody was there for any of these kids, really, were they? That's what Ultra Despair Girls is about. Junko certainly wasn't gonna do that, and let's consider for a second that sure, while Monica did lie to her brother and dad about being paralyzed by them, let's not glance over the very revealing fact that they believed her without question. I'm sure you don't need me to tell you that a child isn't put into a wheelchair by someone else's actions without being hurt in the process. And the fact that these two fully believed without a second thought that they had hurt her badly enough for it to be a realistic outcome for her to be paralyzed from the waist down, yeah, that is extremely damning, and very revealing about what her home life was like. What about the latter? Was this a room she chose at Toa Hills? Doesn't seem likely if she's trying to trick her family, at the time, about being paralyzed. We know she can climb it, but they don't. Was it forced on her? Is this a torture they don't even think she can handle? So then we have to re-examine again her tendency to lie about such a big weakness, because maybe that made all of her abuse revolve around it. Maybe if she weren't just pretending to be anguished now while it actually doesn't do her much harm, the situation would have continued down a path where she would have kept getting hurt so badly that it did genuinely damage her spine for life. Maybe that lie saved her from that fate. So from Monica's point of view, the answer's clear. The way of the world is clear. Why should she feel regret or consider other people's feelings? Her family didn't, and neither did her savior. 
the other Warriors of Hope still have a smidge of reason left in them. They made genuine bonds with each other, so they can still figure themselves out. They know they don't like it when their friends are sad or hurt. They react noticeably when their minds start to change, like when Sho sticks her neck out for Utsuki, or Kamaru raises her concerns toward Shingetsu and protects him from attacks. They've always responded with fighting or fawning, but Monica is the only child who saw her impossibly terrible situation and decided that the way to survive was to try to manipulate her abusers right back. It's war for her if she doesn't want to end up in that chair for real. So the only way she can stay out of it is to learn the rules of battle, to effectively weaponize against her tormentors exactly what they did toward her. And so, that extends too to the people who are good to her. Open connection always means she can lose something or someone. It leaves her vulnerable, and it's therefore not an option. She's never had an opportunity to learn to trust people and no reason to see it as anything more than dangerous if she did. The other warriors wanted to die before Junko saved them, but they could pull back after they saw salvation in her. For Monica, though, Junko didn't arrive as a savior, but as a peer. She understood how to manipulate, to scheme, and to orchestrate, and she could teach Monica how to do it better. Her relationship with Junko was the only time she'd ever been treated as an equal, and it was when Junko was teaching her how to kill her abusers. It's why she's the one who knew Junko was manipulating her to a certain end goal, because Junko could tell her, because they shared it. If people hate Monica for abusing the other warriors of hope, especially the way she did to Utsugi, fair. If people hate her for murder, also fair. But if anyone hates her for the same reasons her predator of a brother and her nightmare of a father do, if anyone thinks she's an inherently broken child who didn't deserve to be shown a better way before she ever arrived here, I just want them to do a bit of self-reflection on that. Look at who agrees with you. That's all I want to say on that matter. Anyway, so now it's all come down to this. When Junko was killed, the wishy-washy Toa group gave up on perpetuating her will, and tired of their typical behavior, that's why Monica targeted this city. A paradise for children was just the promise she made to get the other kids on board, but her whole plan has been to succeed Junko's will by painting the world with despair. And how does she plan to do so? By causing war. And war is exactly what she claims will happen if the controller is broken. Why is that, you may ask? Well, if the kids' helmets explode, then what will happen when the Future Foundation finally arrives after the incident's played out? They'll see the embittered rallied adults celebrating the death of all these headless kids, and they'll naturally start looking into it. They'll blame the Toa group, especially after digging deep enough to find out their sordid history of supporting Junko and manufacturing her killing machines. And thus, they'll enter another war with the Toa group, thinking this town to be full of remnants of despair and crushing the town under heel. Crucially to Monica, though, it won't just end there, because the true remnants would also hear about this and come charging in, causing a full resurgence of the tragedy that has been dying down since Junko's death. That's also the reason she only ever targeted adults without kids, as she needed the adults to be brought to this breaking point, spurred on by their lack of empathy for the children so they would in turn create more child victims, and those pitiful children's power would give rise to this despair. And therein lies the ultimate manipulation that Komaru's growth wasn't just dictated by Komaida, but by Monica herself. Hoping that the sister of the super high school level Hope, who took their Hope, Junko and Oshima, away from them, would in turn become a hero in the eyes of the adults and incite them to take their revenge against the children. He even grew to care about this town, wanting to save it, becoming the Hope for the adults. But even so, you know, Hope isn't always a good thing. At times, Hope can be a terrible burden can be a drive to hurt others. Just like now. What did you think would happen if you gave people who watched their loved ones die hope? And so now, this is the final turn. Monica tells us that this can only end with one side of the conflict being wiped out, and forcing the decision on Komaru's shoulders. Anticipating that she'll concede to her anger, do what all the adults in her life have and would do, she waits for the demon in Komaru to expose itself, even bringing her to the ultimate breaking point by showing her that her and her brother's parents are dead. The strange scrawling on the floor of the torture room being a message from her mother to her children to try to reach them in her final moments. In this worst of all moments, Monica is goading Komaru, goading us to prove her right, to become the successor to Junko and Oshima, and to say for ourselves with our own words that nobody could have ever shown her a better way. Komaru breaks down, unable to even move or speak, fully consumed by grief and hatred. I've seen a lot of people meme on the fact that it asks you whether or not to break the controller so many times throughout this long as hell cutscene, but there is a point to it, and it's this right here. 
Over and over again, we've been forced to make a conscious choice to be better, to keep insisting that the children deserve better, that none of them are so unfixably evil that they all deserve to die for this. It's the repetition that makes it more clearly a conscious choice that we have to keep making, to keep being kind, to keep empathizing with them. Because it's never just something we can choose to do once and leave it at that. It's a lifelong commitment to never give up on people. And that's why it's so heartbreaking in this moment as Haiji screams at us to give in to our hatred, gleefully commanding us to destroy all the kids to sate our hatred and grief, that Kumaru cracks. No matter what happens to adults, no matter what happens to children, no matter what happens to this town, no matter what happens to the world, I don't give a damn anymore. I just don't give a damn. If you choose at any point before this to break the controller, you get the bad ending where the helmets explode. Kamaru describes it as fireworks heralding her as a hero as everyone cheers, claiming it's all thanks to her, before descending into guilt and claiming that everything is all her fault. However, here, at the final crossroads, your choice isn't a choice. Kamaru can't consciously choose to do right by the children anymore. She has reached the exact point Monica knew she would and wanted her to. But if there's one thing UDG has kept reiterating to us all this time, it's that anything you can't do alone, you don't have to. Taking control of Fukawa, we walk towards Komaru who is in a haze, and she tackles her to the floor, grabbing and protecting the controller for what she says is Komaru's own sake. Even as Haiji screams and kicks her, she doesn't budge. Even when Monika offers to trade her the controller for Togami's cell key, Fukawa rejects the entire premise of Monika's goading. She rejects the notion that she only has one choice, saying she'll be taking both, because she could never choose one and leave the other behind as long as both are precious to her. Intervening to help Fukawa, even Utsugi attacks Haiji, but in that moment they're all interrupted as Big Bang Monokuma arrives, supposedly moving on its own, which should be impossible because it can only be controlled by Haiji and Tokuichi. As it crashes through the building, all Monika can do is look up in wonder, grinning and wondering to herself if this familiar feeling could really be. Taking Komaru outside, Fukawa snaps her out of it by slapping her, claiming that it hurts. When Komaru asks what she means because she's the one who hit her, Fukawa says that it hurt her hand, but that's not the only thing it hurts. Asking Komaru to slap her back, she does, and it's that simple thing that brings the girl back down to earth. She says Fukawa's right. It does hurt her hand, and it isn't the only part of her that it hurts. Realizing that her hatred is not the right way, that hurting others is not the right way, Fukawa consolingly hugs onto Kamaru's head, claiming once again that if she can't do something on her own, all she has to do is ask Fukawa for help. God, I care about these two so much. Finally bringing about her own miracle, Kamaru mirrors Fukawa's words. She can't just choose one and leave another behind. Both are precious to her. She won't play Monica's game. She won't prove her right. She's going to save the adults and the children. Even if it means bringing down Big Bang Monokuma herself and destroying what the vengeful adults think is their hope. The boss itself is pretty bombastic, but simple. It has similar problems to the previous ones, but it's thematically very strong. Each time the Stay puffed sized Monokuma's eye changes color, you use the corresponding ammo type to counter it, then give Sho an opportunity to attack it while it's stunned. As the girls help each other, realizing that they're not alone, they leap into the air, firing a final hope-charged shot from the hacking gun, powered too by Fukawa's stun gun, a golden burst consuming the beast as it's defeated once and for all, as its head shoots off into space. It collapses and shoots out the head of Shirakuma, which bounces down. Wait, Shirakuma? Oh boy. Lamenting that what he thinks was his hope is lost, Haiji goes near catatonic. Monica, thoroughly defeated, says this is only a delaying of the inevitable, that this isn't closure. It isn't a hopeful or despair-filled ending. Refusing, even in the end, to take revenge on Monica, Komaru takes the key to Togami's cell from her, saying that she overestimated Komaru, that both of them failed to live up to the expectations of their idols, the super high school level despair and hope, Junko Enoshima and Makoto Naegi respectively. Komaru simply claims that there's no way she could imitate him anyway, and no way she'd want to. I'm not my brother, she says. Makoto is Makoto, and I am me. As Monica lays under the rubble of the collapsing airship, everyone walks away. They weren't looking for the all-or-nothing ending she was. All they can do is try their best in the tomorrow that comes, whether it's good or bad. Going to save Togami, Komaru makes a confession. To save the adults and the children both, even after spending all this time trying to escape, she won't run or leave them behind. She wants to stay. And with that leading us into the epilogue, let's talk about Chapter 5 itself for a second. The puzzles are some of the best in show so far, bearing a few annoying exceptions, but honestly the levels themselves are pretty hit and miss. Some of the sections are especially annoying, and the bosses are… Whew, 
The wealth of lore and interesting story content going on here is actually quite admirable, and I applaud them for going as wild as they did with all of this. However, despite how much I find to praise in the final few cutscenes, there's a reason why a lot of people take umbrage with it, and that's because it's quite long. Like, nearly half of this chapter feels like it's just taken up by this one long unbroken cutscene where you're asked about the button again every so often. I get why it was done this way, and again, I think the button prompt in particular has very big thematic significance, but this scene definitely feels like it could have either been trimmed down or balanced with the gameplay a bit more. Though I guess that has always remained an issue that UDG has struggled with up until now, so same crap different day I suppose. Monica as a villain has definitely been the star of the show, and while I wish elements of her backstory were elucidated upon a bit more, I also can't help but wonder if they were trying to have their cake and eat it too by not wanting her to be an unambiguously evil child, but also still wanting her to fill the Junko role of frustrating the audience's attempts to understand her by leaving her personal details as vague as she could manage. If that were the idea, I can definitely see where it would be difficult to balance, but personally I'd have chosen to simply ditch that tradition for Monica herself and let the game succeed a bit more thematically because of those differing merits. Oh well, I still think what we got here was pretty good at least. In terms of gameplay, it's certainly not the best chapter, but in terms of story, I'd say it unambiguously is. And maybe that's a hot take, but this is my video where you came to hear my opinion, so I'm just gonna say it. And now let me go ahead and say some things about the epilogue too. As Monica awakens, she finds she's being carried by Komaida, who says he'll ensure Monica is raised into the best successor to despair she can be, so she can eventually give rise to her perfect war and ultimately a perfect hope that will rise to combat her. He does claim he has other plans to attend to soon, though. In the background, a mysterious stranger wheelbarrows the severed heads of Kurakuma and Shirakuma, who, while talking together about the plan to create the successor, reveals that they were always working together. While Kurakuma watched over the kids, Shirakuma spurred on the adults with his sickly sweet demeanor. Regarding each other both as wicked, they begin to speak in trade, leading up to something we may have suspected by now. <laughs> Yep, remember how this takes place before SDR2? Well, that's not only because we saw what the Remnants and Future Foundation were up to, but unbeknownst to us, also what Junko was up to. Both of these bears having her voice actor was no coincidence, as they are both half of one collective alter ego Junko, their AIs being the culmination of the digital backup she created of herself. In stirring chaos and bringing their respective sides against each other, the pitch-black Kurakuma giving hope to the kids and the duplicitously sweet snow-white Shirakuma bringing despair to the adults, eventually ensured their own mutual destruction, leading to them being brought together and now collected by this person. Who, you may ask? Well, as said person gets tired of listening to Junko rave to herself, they reveal themselves by smashing their hands inside of the heads to grab the chips, prompting Junko to say she didn't even know they could still feel this way, revealing that yes indeed, it's Izuru Kamakura. Admitting that she'll leave the rest to him, but knows that by the time she sees him next he'll likely be an entirely different person, Junko Enoshima says farewell again, telling Kamakura that she hopes the future is one he can't predict, before he severs the wires, walking off with the two chips towards his plan for the Neo World program, which as we know, will continue in Super Danganronpa 2. God, this scene is so hype. Cutting to Togami, freed and outside of town, he talks to Naegi on a laptop about everything that's gone on and relays a message from Komaru to him. Explaining her decision to save both to him, we also see as she explained the same to Fukawa, to which Fukawa claims that she has no choice but to also stay behind and help her friend, because that's what friends are for. So she'll wait here, trying to change what she can, do what she can, waiting until the day her brother resolves everything with the remnants and comes home. She even claims she never found real evidence of their parents' deaths, revealing the possibility that Monica could have faked it all. With Naegi and Togami vowing to partner together once again and end the tragedy, they sail off towards New Horizons. And the credits even show us that the warriors are all still alive and okay having banded together to change for the better, as Monica elsewhere styles herself even more after her savior, planning something big for the future. And uh, Haiji is depressed. Good, genuinely don't care about him. At the very end, Komaru gets up in town to start her day, and walks along with Fukawa as they once again vow to do their best, ending Danganronpa another episode, Ultra Despair Girls. And once again, I'm forced to reiterate, man, this game is polarizing. Its gameplay is all over the place in terms of quality, and it's got more than its share of jank. 
It's trying to be so many different things at once that ultimately it feels like it doesn't particularly strongly succeed at nearly any of them, unfortunately. The story, while interesting in places, could definitely use more development in others. Some parts of the story and portrayal of certain things is just downright awful, making a spectacle of itself and leaving a permanent stain that isn't easily forgiven, brushed past, or recommended. At the same time, though, buried underneath its myriad of flaws, it still manages to straggle and bring some interesting ideas to the surface. It has fun puzzles here and there, it has an interesting aesthetic and tone, its portrayal of the complicated issues surrounding the way we as a society treat children and how we should treat them is honestly one of the most thought-provoking I've seen in a game of this type before. And honestly, as half-baked as many of its themes turn out in the end because of their execution, the sentiments here are ultimately why I think UDG deserves to exist at all. For all of its many shortcomings, it excels at pushing both this topic and the complicated nature of what hope and despair can mean to people individually, rather than just as looming concepts. And I can't not give it credit for taking that theme to new places, emphasizing it meaningfully through the lens of characters and structures that greatly facilitate those conversations, even if it could have done a better job on delivering on such a thing. Ultra Despair Girls is a game that, for some reasons, I really hate. And for other reasons, I really love. It's a split right down the middle between exacerbating my despair and filling me with hope. In as loving and derogatory a way as I can possibly muster to say simultaneously, I guess in that sense, it embodies Danganronpa itself more than almost anything else can. And I suppose that's worth something. I will throw everyone away I will try to cut off all the pain Despair will finally fall A clouded sky, a town filled with rubble How is it that you could find The hope in this to survive Since when were you able to push me forward such an unknown place With such strength in your face It will be okay So I'll continue wandering on And I'll be here with you A labyrinth of confusion won't stop me No matter the place I don't know everything to say I'll always have your back But even so, I know I'll make it there someday Throw everyone away I will try to cut off all the pain Even if it aches, even if it takes it all So we'll both make sure no matter the time Amidst all the flames that are burning bright We'll hold up our hopes and we'll stand up tall This despair will finally fall Uh, what's next again? The Danganronpa 3 anime? Jeez. Maybe I'm the one who can't do things alone over here because I really can't imagine how I'm gonna do that by myself. Maybe I can... One second. Yo! Hey, Austin. Are you busy at the moment? I mean, with the whole webcomic thing I do, Yeah, I sort of have my hands full. Why? Well, I don't want to try to distract you from what you've got to do. I'm just a little torn on this next one I'm planning. I'm not sure if I can effectively cover it without somebody to give me a little bit of help along the way. Oh, you mean like a collab thing? Well, I mean, I guess I could consider it if I have the time. Uh, what's the video about? Oh, it's uh, Danganronpa 3. How did you get here so fast? Why through the wall? There's a door! Hang it around the three. Huh? Sure. Yeah. Let's talk about Dangan Rumpa three.
Hey everybody, so quick heads up. Yes, the next big entry in the DR retrospective will be about Danganronpa 3, the anime, and V3 will be after that. But I'll be honest, I need to take a little break. Now that doesn't mean no videos will be coming out. In fact, I actually plan to make a smaller video covering Danganronpa if very soon, for those of you who were asking for my thoughts on that, so look forward to it. I just need to give this one the time in the oven it deserves, and trust me when I say it'll definitely be worth the wait. So if you could please continue to support me and my couple of smaller things until then, I'd greatly appreciate it. Appreciate it. Speaking of support and appreciation, thank you for watching this video. If you'd like to help it and this channel succeed, then please leave a like and especially a comment, as it does wonders to help this video get picked up by the algorithm and shown to even more people. Statistically, like 80% of my viewers are, by the way, not subscribed yet, so if you haven't done that already, come on guys, little button right under the video there, all it takes is one click and you'll get notified of everything I do in the future. It's a pretty sweet deal. If you'd like to further support the creation of my videos, you can also head over to my Patreon linked in the description and get fun rewards for your trouble, or you can make one-time donations to my Ko-fi if you prefer that model. Follow me on Twitter at NezumiVA if you feel so inclined to see me ramble or yell at me about my anime opinions, and feel free to send me something via my PO box set up with Throne if you've ever wanted to do something like that. All things I've mentioned are linked in the description below. Thank you again to NordVPN for sponsoring this video, thank you once again to everyone for watching, and I'll see you next time. Peace.